Christ, there we go. That should be the mic working. Hopefully the mic is working. Uh, it looks like it is. I have not finished setting this up at all, so this is going to be super, super scuffed. Worse than usual. Mic's a little low. Uh, that's odd. Because it shouldn't be. The game might be set too low. Give me a minute. How's that? That should be a little better. Might actually turn the gain up a touch more. We'll turn up to about four. We good? Cool. I do actually need to set it up more as well so that like when I am using it, I'm not shouting. I'm gonna piss everyone off, but as long as you can hear me. I gotta change the compressor settings too, because I've got it compressing like on the wrong side. It's compressing my voice and it should be compressing the game audio, but it's not. Anyway, uh, let's tab back in. Actually, before we do that, let's remember to actually close our browser so I'm not needlessly overtaxing my PC. Thanks for the reset, man. Appreciate it. Alrighty. So, here we are. T72 boy. smoke this gun throws up when it goes off is pretty impressive. Monk S. Monk S, indeed. Thank you for the resub. And welcome back, everybody. So we are on Beepsky Mark 2 now. Beepsky Mark 1 is sitting on the floor behind me. Starting off with a little GHPC now that T72's out, and then we'll probably uh, see if I can DCS it. You may notice, because I'm on the side, the T72 does not actually have a CAN sensor, uh, unlike the T80 and the T64, at least the latest T64, it doesn't automatically compensate for being on a hill slope, which makes the memory a little more difficult than it needs to be. That's why I'm missing so many of those shots. Right out here, some level. Near my uh, platoon leg cranking away next to me. Oh, this guy's still up. We'll deal with him. Boom. It's a solid hit, but he's not dead yet. This should be interesting. So the carousel doesn't hold uh, that, well I mean it holds a few rounds, uh, it's like 22 rounds or something ready in the carousel. You have some extra ammunition distributed around the inside of the tank, which are used to reload the carousel. However, that's not something you want to be doing in combat because it takes a fucking long time. You have to work around the auto-loaded. Basically you want to reverse um, to load it, which is not ideal in combat. God, I'm bad with this today. Let's see where these are going. Try and get one under him. T-72 
1972, please. I know where it's going. I'll try the other guy. Anyway, um, the majority of your ammunition is going to be uh, HE for supporting infantry and taking out lightly fortified positions, ATGMs, things like that. Uh, then you have a split between Sabo and Heat. The majority of that's that one hit him. We'll give him another. We're hitting a touch low, so we're going to bring the aim point up. Still hitting low. Oh, we're firing HE, of course. It's not going to knock him out anyway. But what we can do is we can um, pop out of this to you or reverse back. I think they're mostly not knocked out, but they're not going to fire back at us. And I'll show you the X-ray view of this. You can see my carousel is now almost empty. We've got a single round left there in the back. And it takes a very long time to restock the carousel. That's 18 seconds per round. Per round. So it's going to take a long time. But you can see the extra ammunition stowage back there. Uh, the top left round that you can see, just under the turret basket, is a heat round with that long probe on the front. And then below and around that is HE. The orange things are throwing charges because it's a two piece ammunition system. You have the round itself and then the charge. Uh, and then the Sabo rounds, Sabo darts, are the guys that don't have any visible fins on them because the, the dart itself has a um, propellant charge that goes behind it. So technically Sabo rounds are overcharge ammunition because you have the actual throwing charge plus an extra. Jesus, you need to shave? Yes, I do. Really badly. Although the mirror in the bathroom is not exactly the best for shaving. It's a tiny little mirror. It's covered in rough spots. We work until 3 in the morning because I've been unable to start my lab assignment. Oof. Uh, might be game audio being higher than your voice, actually. You might just be talking quieter now that I think about it. Probably a bit of both. Let me just... Let me figure out which direction my microphone's pointing. Is that any better? It, actually, no. That's the label. That'll be on the back. Sorry, I know I'm making a lot of noise here with uh, manhandling it. We'll try that. We'll try that, it should be a little closer. And I will also pop over to OBS and we will turn this up a little. I think it's the compression. So what we'll do is we'll actually turn the compressor off because it's not properly configured. It means that like, I'm going to nuke your ears if I get excited or whatever, but it'll have to do for now. I've got to properly set the audio up on this because if, like, I'm in a completely different shape of room. It's going to change everything. But that'll do for now. So, uh, let me just get this back up here so I can read it. Ain't killing an M60 with HE. No, but you can overpressure the crew. Um, HE in this does do overpressure damage. It will kill crew members. You can actually see now, see the carousel starting to refill. You can see the throwing charges sit on top in the T-72 and then the round sits beneath. Uh, in the T-64 and the T-80, they use a different style of autoloader, more um, more like what American battleships used to use in World War II, where it kind of, it has a two-piece tray um, and it sits like this in the turret. And then when it loads, it pulls this up and it flattens that joint and then a ram comes in. So you've got, uh, it's a much quicker loading system. Um, it's mechanically a bit simpler, but it also means that the tank is more prone to ammunition detonation because the um, the throwing charges are the parts that are sitting vertical around the ring of the turret. So you've got a much larger surface area for something to come in, penetrate and hit a uh, throwing charge and set the ammunition off. So the autoloader is better as a loader, but as a safety device, not really. Uh, this is much safer, which is why they abandoned the, um, the T64, T80 autoloader style for the T90 and and other such developments. 
Now, because this is an early version of this auto-loading system, um, it can only rotate one direction, so seek times for ammunition increase as you start to deplete it, especially if you select a type of ammo that's on the other side of the carousel. Um, the T64 and the T80, both their auto-loaders can rotate either direction. The T72 can only rotate one direction. Um, I think that was changed in the T90. And what I can actually show you, I'm going to intentionally just yeet rounds off into the wild blue yonder here because I want to show you the auto loader in action. So we'll just laser this guy and lob them in his general direction. So watch the uh, watch the auto loader work here. Now it doesn't animate the actual lifting of the ammunition into the gun, but you can see that the auto loader does rotate, and the uh, currently loaded round will disappear. Or at least it should. I did it once and then stopped. What have I done here? I've broken something, I think. Or we found a bug. There we go, now it's rotating. Yeah, the T-72 and the T-90, um, their auto-loader will throw the case stub out the back of the tank. The T-64 and the T-80 actually places the case stub back into the tray that the ammunition came from. Uh, the advantage of that is you're not breaching the tank's NBC protection in a contaminated battlefield to get rid of the case stub. But on the other hand, a disadvantage of that is the case stub smokes the fuck out of the inside of the turret. So if the ventilation's not working, you have a really bad time. Uh, it's not the kind of stuff you want a hot box. Anyway, we actually do have Sabre rounds back in now, so I'll stop mucking around with that. We will laze him. Just make sure. I think I've caused a whoopsie. It's not doing things it should be doing. I've broken it somehow. Well done, me. This was just released the other day, so it's bound to have a few little pickups here and there. Do we have ATGMs in this? Yes. Uh, no tank-fired ones at the moment, but there are a 9K111, uh, whose name I can't repeat on Twitch, but um, there's that and a tow. Uh, the tow is also mounted on the M901 iTow vehicle, um, which is available in the firing range, but it's not in game yet, like in missions, just because it's not complete. They haven't got a damage model uh, for that vehicle yet. So there's also going to be ATGMs on the BMPs. Uh, the BMP 1 and 1P are both coming fairly soon. Uh, the Bradley, the Chadley, uh, that's coming soon. That'll have toes as well. And it's very likely that in the not too distant future, depending when they can get scans of the tanks and get all the systems programmed, uh, we'll see T-64s, uh, Soviet T-72s, which do have the ATGMs. This is an East German one without. Um, and T-80s, uh, we'll probably see them then. How much does this game cost? So at the moment, um, I think it's like a couple of dollars on Patreon per month just to get all of the, the content in the game currently as, as a tester. The game hasn't released yet. This is very early alpha, so... Basically, they're using the Patreon to fund development of the game. Uh, only one of the six developers is working full-time. I think they might actually have seven now, because they, they said they had an animator on board now. Um, but it's a very small team. Only one of them is working on this full-time. The rest are all doing it in their spare time. So every little bit helps. And basically, there's a public version of this, uh, which gives you access to the M60A3 and the T55, as well as the BRDM2. Uh, and the M113. So you can play that for free, totally free. Uh, you just run it through the Itch um, app, which is kind of like just a game launcher that you can use for indie games. Um, but the Patreon version gives you access to the T72, and generally the Patreon version gets new features a little bit before the public build does. Um, you know, just to kind of give people an incentive to support the project. So how does the tank tell what round is in which position? Um, I can't say for sure on the T72, but I believe on the T64's autoloader, the top of the um, the top of the canister that the throwing charge sits in has like a little um, a little knurled 
thing that sticks out the top and basically the position that indexes on something on the auto loader it's, it's all electromechanical basically so it uses that to figure out what's in that cartridge and then it rotates it into place loads it fires puts the case stub back in and rotates it away so it's very old school uh, there's there's not really much computerization going on in the you know modern sense uh, it's all like old analog stuff which is very very fun Like ammo detonation, what happens to the other guy? Yeah, really. No, this isn't a T-72A, this is a T-72M1. So this is a um, an export tank. The T-72M was exported, and the T-72M1 was an export version uh, specifically for Warsaw Pact nations, I believe. Um, the Czechs use them, the East Germans use them, the Poles use them for, I think, for a while. I think the Poles mostly got them towards the end of the Cold War, if not afterwards. Um, it has a few downgrades, one of which being it can't fire the ATGMs. Um, the Soviets also had versions of their own tanks which couldn't fire ATGMs just as a cheapening measure, um, because the ATGM and the sight system for it particularly are very expensive. Um, so for instance you have the T-64B, which was designed to fire the ATGM, and the T-64B1, which is a T-64B, but they stripped out the uh, ATGM site because it was just too expensive. Yeah, as Max said. Got a new computer that could probably run DCS on low graphic settings. Just wondering if Intel UHD 630 runs well. I would not be able to tell you. Um, I'm on a new PC myself, but it's uh, it's... If this doesn't run D DCS on good settings, I'll be very, very disappointed because this is a, like a proper good computer for the first time in my life. Not QR codes on the cases. I mean, technically it was like a mechanical kind of QR code. Let's go into the after action report just to see where I hit these guys. So that went straight through the bottom of his tank. Did some good damage. Of course, with Sabre rounds, you're going to see... Um, I think you could look through the terrain before. That might be a new whoopsie-daisy. Um, with Sabre rounds, you're not going to see as much fragmentation or spalling as you would with a lot of the rounds I was firing out of the T-55. These are very high-velocity darts. These just go clean through the tank, as you can see. I also had kind of a bad angle on a lot of these guys, so I wasn't really effectively hitting them. Uh, the T-72 doesn't have auto-lead, at least not in this variant. Um, later on there was a variant that did have auto-lead, I think the Model 1989. Um, well, it wasn't auto-lead. What you would do is you'd laser target, and then it would display a um, numerical value next to the gun sight, like within the field of view of the gun sight. And that was how many mils of deflection you had to get. So it was still manually led, but it would at least give you like a cheat code of how much you needed to lead. Sasquatch, thanks for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Need a face light? I know, um, I've got like a little lamp over there, but I need like a proper light here somewhere, and I also need uh, some of that soundproofing stuff, just so my voice doesn't carry too much. They have AAA tanks here? No, not yet. Um, whether they'll be playable, I don't know. So the idea be be um, behind Gunner Heat PC is it's not meant to be like War Thunder or World of Tanks, where it's just, you take a whole bunch of armoured vehicles and throw them into a free-for-all. This is meant to be more realistic. This is meant to simulate what tanks are actually meant to do, not what people in War Thunder think tanks are meant to do. So you'll be, um, you, you might see helicopters or fixed wing aviation, but they will be either providing fire support for you, they won't be flyable, um, or they'll be killing you. So you need to, you know, kill other tanks, you need to help support infantry. Um, one of the plans for this is to have things like the M113 or the BMP able to deploy infantry squads to an area. So then, uh, you know, you'll actually be able to do proper combined arms operations with the infantry. So as a tank, you'll be supporting them, uh, knocking out enemy tanks, stuff like that. It's not just going to be like a... Um, 
there's no tech tree, there's no unlocks, there's no economy. You get tanks, you get a scenario, you kill other things. That's basically what it is. There will be multiplayer, there will be multi-crew. Um, so there'll be, it'll mostly be oriented around co-op, but I think they have said that they're looking at PvP in the future as well, but it won't be um, War Thunder kind of PvP. It'll be more DCS PvP. And when I say DCS PvP, I mean like a proper DCS mission sort of PvP thing, not Growling Sidewinder. Imagine if this game had War, uh, War Thunder physics. The physics are a little janky still, because it's early days, but um, I would say they're probably still better than War Thunder. 125 save would have zero, issue with, uh, zero issues with killing M60A3s. If I can hit them in the right place, yes. The problem is that um, at this kind of range, and especially because I was parked on a slope, I was not getting the shots I wanted, so we'll rerun this mission, but I'll park it on the, um, the flat road, and you should see a much better, um, much better kind of accuracy from the gun, because it doesn't have to deal with, well, I don't have to deal with that canted angle. So, with anything, uh, with, with a rifle, with a tank, um, you know, technically if you had, like, say a battleship tilted on an extreme angle somehow, um, you'll get issues with cant and it affects accuracy quite badly. The larger something is, the better it's able to account for that. You know, your average infantry rifle can't factor it in at all, it's on the shooter to do it. Um, tanks couldn't generally do it until sort of the mid-Cold War. The M60 can account for it, I believe. Um, the T64 later versions, the, T the T80 can, I think the T90. I think the T90 can, because I think the T90 uses a similar fire control system to the T80. So we'll, um, we'll skip through here. So that one actually penetrated one of his uh, tracks, went straight through it, then ricocheted off the ground under him, and then snuck out through the other side. That went just under the tank like under the whole floor of the tank right there, you see that? So if that shot had been a little shorter and ricocheted, it would have gone up through the floor. That's an HE round, and you can, oh sorry, that's a heat round, actually, that's what that is. So you can see how much uh, spalling heat tends to throw, and fragments off the warhead as well. That one went straight through, that was actually quite a nice shot. That one is a bit low. Still did some good damage, uh, got into the propellant, but mostly skipped along the floor. That was an HE round. Okay, so these are my HE shots here, and you can see that some of them have gone up through the bottom of the tank. So this hit the ground under his uh, engine bay, penetrated hull floor, hit engine, penetrated lower rear plate, fuel tank, hit transmission, penetrated row wheel, hull equipment, axle mount, swing arm, that's suspension components, hit right track, penetrated right track. So he's basically dead in the water because of that shot. I mean, he already was, but he'd be even more dead in the water. I missed him there, I was a bit short. But you can actually see one of the um, one of the pieces of shrapnel ricocheted off the inside of the tin work over the track there, and then spat out the side, that's quite cool. That one was very short. That one uh, broke a bunch of suspension components but didn't actually damage the tank itself. Likewise there, mostly knocked out track components. That one, um, again damage a track. I thought I was shooting a bit low but it's just because, you know, the fragments were mostly going down into the track and the suspension. And there we go. That didn't overpressure the crew, but HE can overpressure people in this. So we got that one. Oh, here we go. Here we go. That penetrated. So that's an HE round. It hit on the lower front plate. And we then have penetrated idler wheel, which is that front one there. Hit driver's left leg, penetrated driver's left leg, hit driver's right leg and penetrated it, penetrated road wheel and penetrated MG ammo store. So that threw two fragments inside the tank. Actually, it threw f three or four inside the tank and one of them nearly hit the ammunition. But that one, uh, that one really screwed up the driver and the other one went across the hole, didn't hit anything.
every single thing you can think of is calculated. Yeah, this simulates um, the oxygen consumption of an ammunition fire. So if the hatches are open, it will burn um, hotter because it has access to more oxygen. If the hatches are closed, it can't burn as hot because it can't combust. Well, the ammunition combusts because it's self-oxidizing, but once the ammo is gone, it burns out. Whereas if the hatches are open, it's liable to burn for longer and smolder much longer. Um, it factors in things like the, um, the propellant will burn right away, but things like um, HE warheads or heat warheads will sympathetically detonate afterwards. They won't go at the same time as the propellant, they will detonate afterwards from overheating. This simulates everything you could possibly think of. It's really impressive. Um, yeah, oxygen's calculated. The hitboxes on the crew members go down to the level of individual eyeballs. Um, it differentiates between hitting someone's head, hitting someone's skull, and hitting someone's brain. So, you know, the, the difference between having a big gouge across your forehead, but you, you know, you survive it more or less okay, you just go get some stitches, or having your skull cracked, or having your fucking brains all over the inside of the tank. Um, it also simulates spinal injuries, the difference between the spinal column and the spinal cord. Uh, it simulates different organs, left lung, right lung, heart, guts. It's really impressive, and hands as well, because the idea is they want to have a uh, dynamic campaign going forwards where crew injuries matter. So if your crew members survive being hit, but they're wounded from it, they may not be able to do their job properly anymore. You know, if a commander loses one eye, he's going to have a lot of trouble. Um, if a, a loader loses his dominant hand, then you can't really load the gun anymore, you know? Has Hesh actually seen success in combat? Uh, back in the 50s and 60s it was useful, but not so much now. Like, Hesh was a good idea at the time, but it's been kind of outpaced by technology. There's not really any point in it anymore. There are better HE rounds that do the same thing or more things um, and can be fired out of smoothbore guns. Um, Hesh itself is not going to do anything to a tank, really. And for knocking down fortifications, airburst is much better. You know, you, you have airburst rounds now that you can punch through a wall and blow up on the other side of it. Um, whereas Hesh, you're just demolishing the wall. You're not really doing anything to what's behind it. Ships can easily tilt. No, I, I know about that, but I mean, like, if you could cant all the guns on the ship in a direction they're not supposed to cant, like, not just from heavy seas or a bit of a list or whatever, but if you could really cant it. Point being, it affects the ballistics, but I believe most uh, shipborne fire control systems, even in World War II, could account for that to some degree. Game name, Gunner Heat PC, otherwise known as GHPC. If you want to get it, it is on itch.io, um, the public version, because it's very early, you know, basically alpha, if not pre-alpha. Um, the public version gives you a couple vehicles to play with. Uh, you don't get to play with the T-72, that's a, a patron's, own, pat patrons, Patreon, um, patrons only thing I can speak. Um, but you do get to play with the other vehicles currently in the game. So the public, up or the, like the public build is generally updated a little bit behind the patron build. Um, and it doesn't have all of the vehicles available, but it's enough to give you a sense of what's coming to the game. They wanted to make sure that people could pick up the game and play it and get an idea of what's coming, and then if they liked it, they could actually support it and get more vehicles. Is there a minimum spec chart for the game? It is not optimized at all at the moment because it's so early in development. Um, my old PC struggled to run it on the larger map. My new PC struggles to run it on the larger map, and this is a really powerful PC. Um, so if you're on an older system, you're probably going to have some problems with it for now. Um, probably, I don't know what the timelines are like, maybe in six months or a year it might be better optimized. You'll be able to run it on a lower end system. But for now, um, you could try it, but I suspect it's not going to run very well. If a tank crew dies, what do the other tank crews do with the body? Uh, it depends, really. It depends. If the tank, you know, if, if something comes through the tank, hits one of the crew members, but doesn't catastrophically detonate the ammunition or just skull fuck the rest of the crew, 
um, probably they'd take him, you know, that they'd drive the tank away from combat once the fight's over and they'd give him a proper burial or something. But particularly with tanks like this, they're full of ammunition, um, like absolutely chockers with ammunition, and they're being fired at by things with a lot of power behind them. Um, it's very likely that anything that enters the crew compartment is either going to kill multiple crew or it's going to blow the tank up. So this is the problem with a modern tank, right? Either you just shrug off everything that hits you and you're fine, or you have a catastrophic ammunition fire or an explosion or just fragments zing around the inside of the tank and cut the entire crew to pieces. It's really quite grisly. Hesh ended up being pretty good demolition tool in Afghanistan. Yeah, Afghanistan is somewhere where it would actually be useful because uh, those mud compounds that they build are really, really strong. Um, I think the preferred method for, for basically forcing an entry into one of those compounds was a frame charge, which is essentially just what Hesh does, um, you know, except handheld. Um, it's, it's like a big, it's kind of like a big um, butterfly net, except instead of a net, you have plastic explosive all around the, um, like the ring at the top of it. They use them to force holes through walls, vehicles, whatever, um, and they worked quite well there. Hesh basically does the same thing. Got a toaster upgrade, double wide, extra slots, and auto lift? Yeah, yeah. I got top of the line toaster now. All right, uh, we've got a couple more shots here. Yeah, nothing that interesting there. Let's rerun this mission, and we'll try and shoot from flat ground so you can see the difference. So did he. I see you thinking you're cute. See how much easier it is to hit these guys now? Oh, there's another one. really see what I hit because it didn't flash up for long enough but I definitely hit something there. He was having a bad day. Got to get a better sense of how much I need to lead these guys with this gun. Okay, we're out of safer. We'll go to heat. I think there's only these two left. Maybe aiming a little low or a little high, it's hard to tell at this range. I'll have a go at this guy. That's the auto loader empty. So we're gonna start the restock and we're gonna reverse away. Fire from flat ground, you might get killed. When I say flat ground, I don't mean flat as in along the longitudinal aspect of the tank. I mean the uh, directional. 
lateral, whatever you want to call it, aspect of the tank, if the tank is tilted left or right, that's when you start having problems because the gun's canted away from the sight. And adding cant to a gun barrel really screws with the ballistics. Um, it's, it is not good. Again, some tanks have sensors to deal with this and they automatically compensate. The T-72 does not. In any case, those M60s were dead before they even knew what was coming. Okay, I'm going to end the restock there because we do actually have a round up. You can see the massive difference in ballistics between the Sabre rounds and the Heat rounds there. So watch the sight reset for Heat as I load it here. The reticle will jump downwards like that. That is the difference. It's quite a significant drop off from the Heat rounds because they're much heavier, right? They're moving slower, they're heavier. That's more like it. I don't think he's going to cook off, but I would say he's pretty fucked. I don't think any of these guys are a particular threat to me anymore, so I'm just going to drive down there. I'll try not to yeet off that, it might not do the suspension much good. in the new PC, exclamation mark specs will tell you I've updated it already. I should probably do like an exclamation mark old spec so you can compare the old and the new. It's quite a significant difference. Yeah, the Sabos these things fire are ridiculous. I think the more modern Sabo rounds are actually more than two kilometers a second. Um, they're really something. Want to see a gun that can pull vacuum in the barrel? Super capitating fucking saber rounds for tanks. Let's do it. We've done it for torpedoes, or rather the Russians have done it for torpedoes. Let's see it for tanks. You can see just how long it's taking to restock the carousel, and that's probably a little quicker than real life even. Um, I've actually watched videos of a T-64 having its autoloader restocked, and it was a really slow process. Um, there were two guys inside and they were basically working around the autoloader mechanism because there's a lot of stuff you have to do by hand to refill it. Um, you have to set the, the carousel in the right position, you have to make sure it indexes correctly, you have to then make it actually uh, basically reverse the load cycle. So it's quite something. And they have modelled seek times in this, so I did kind of demonstrate it before, but if you um, fire a shot that's got another of the same ammo type next to it, say you fire a saber round, there's one right next to it, the loader will just go whoop, over to the next position. Whereas if you fire and you have to ro uh, reload something on the other side of the carousel, the carousel has to accelerate, turn around, decelerate, stop, and then load it. Um, so it does factor that in, and it does actually accelerate and decelerate can't see it so much with uh, loading the next round, it's there, it's just not very visible, but when it has to turn all the way around, it's really noticeable. You see it speed up and that has to kind of wind down as it goes across. Really impressive. So, uh, them's some dead M60s. We're going to go ahead and get rid of the restocking. We have a high explosive round up the spout at the moment. Now, unfortunately, there's no way to unload the round in the barrel and then reload something else, not even with the hand-loaded tanks. I don't know if that's planned for the future, um, but it would be a nice feature where it's, you know, possible in the real thing. Let's put this HE round under his turret bustle if we can. Okay, so it didn't penetrate. Oh, he's jumped. Okay, his hatch is open. Never mind. 
Where's this last M60 hiding? There must be one that's not technically dead yet. Otherwise the uh, mission would have ended. Hiding down here in the low ground maybe? These guys are both dead. Watch me get popped in the side. It might actually it might actually be him. There might be one surviving crew member or something. So we'll give him another shot. You can see the Delta D system winding down the range based on my own tank's movement. Very, very handy system. The M60 doesn't have a comparable system. The M1 Abrams has a better version, basically. Okay, let's put this. There. Of course it hits everything but the ammunition stores. We'll try up here. Right into the ammo. Unless he's already emptied his ready rack. Okay, let's try down here. Maybe not. Yeet. Those two are definitely dead. But see, his hatches are open, so his crew should have jumped. Must be one hiding somewhere. I'm gonna go ahead and cheat, guys. There is one. Oh, he's all the way over here, and I wonder I couldn't find him. Okay, we'll go back to our T-72. My, uh, buddy over there is reloading his carousel. See that? I'll actually get rid of the convoy lights, too. Since it's not night time, we don't need them. So that last M60 is over here somewhere, I think. In all the confusion, he's not fastest. It is actually quite easy for that to happen. Um... The 125mm gun, the 2A46, or the D81, depending which terminology you want to use, is a massively powerful gun. I mean, this gun is like, it's 125mm, that's World War II standard kind of division or core level artillery. That, that is a serious gun. Um, but it throws up so much dust and smoke when it fires that you temporarily lose your situational awareness completely for a couple seconds. And it was apparently just enough time for this guy to sneak past me. We're gonna go ahead and cancel after this Saber round loads. Just so we have a dart round ready to go. Gotta watch out, because if he hits me in the sides or the rear, or if he hits me in the uh, like the turret face right next to the gun, he can kill me quite easily. However, if he hits the turret face like on the cheeks, there's nothing he can do to me. The um, composite armor on the turret pretty much laughs off the M60 Sabo rounds. A lot of the time they don't even get through the um, through the carts, let alone to the second left or uh, second layer of steel. And this is only a T72M1. If we had a T72B, uh, that would be very scary indeed. The M60 would have pretty much no hope up here somewhere. Now the AI can be a little dumb at times, um, partly because tanks have really bad situational awareness so they, they, they probably just can't see you, um, but I do think it is partly as well because it's still very heavily in development. Sometimes they won't see you when you're right in front of them. Also, if you kill the commander, they're much less likely to see you because, you know, that's one less pair of eyes, and that's the only pair of eyes that has all-round vision of the tank. Everyone else has a very narrow field of view. Oh, Mr. M60, where are you? Pretty sure he had it over here. Bit of a look around for him. 
Is it a month? Yep, new PC indeed. Finally. <laughs> Took long enough, but we are up and running. I still had a couple things I need to do probably uh, tomorrow or the day after. Just moving files across from my old hard drives, uh, setting up a couple things, getting a few programs reinstalled, a few drivers I'm missing, but we are at least to the point where I can play and I can stream. No idea where this guy's gone. None at all. You can see the smoke from where he was, so he's probably over here somewhere. You can see the turret traverse time on the T-72 is quite slow. Um, it's a reasonably big, heavy turret, full of complex machinery. Whereas the T-55 turret tends to snap around a bit, this is a bit slow. sneak around a tank battalion after a battle without getting noticed. Oh yeah, um, back when I used to play a lot of Red Orchestra, one of my favourite things to do was playing as infantry and hunting tanks with like Panzerfausts or anti-tank rifles, because you could sneak right up to a tank, and if you approached it from the right angle, they wouldn't know you were there. Um, and so sometimes it'd be funny to either throw a smoke grenade onto the engine deck, so they couldn't see anything from all the smoke, and everyone just was like, there's a ball of smoke moving around, let's shoot it. Um, so everyone would just focus fire on them and they wouldn't be able to tell what was going on. The other fun thing to do is get up on the back of the tank and just like smack your rifle butt into the back of the turret until the commander poked his head out, see what all the noise was, and then you just shoot him. Thought you are playing War Thunder for a second? No. No, this is, uh, this is something War Thunder should be scared of, honestly. Might not kill it, but I think it will definitely hurt it. I did actually play some War Thunder the other day, um, mostly in the T64. I just tend not to stream it as much because it frustrates me very quickly, and I'm not that good at it. Where has this guy gone? I think he might have deserted. He's just, he saw what happened to his buddies there, and he was like, nah bro, I'm not having any of this. What they just got, I'm not having. What? Hang on. What's that? Is that my buddy or is that... Oh, no. Shit. Hello. I don't know why he hasn't fired at me, but I'm glad he hasn't. That was a bit short. Boom. That got him. Let's go through the after action report. Let's see what I did. So that was my... I think that was... No, that wasn't my first shot. That was my buddy's first shot. Because you can see it came from the other side of the hill. And that was a pretty good one. It went straight through the top of the gun mantlet where it's thinner. Through the top of the turret. You can see it through a whole bunch of fragments out the top. Just went straight out the top of the turret. So they would have had a lot of energy to come out at that angle. And then the rest kind of went to the back. The lower energy um, projectiles, or fragments rather, which are the orange and red colours, they tend to bounce around inside the tank more, while the yellow ones are high energy. They're, they're just fucking see ya. They're gone. That was a non-damaging hit. Uh, I don't know if that was a bounce or if that shattered. I think it shattered looking at the angle. And that came through the turret ring and uh, straight into the loader's left leg. That would have taken his leg off easily. And then into the engine compartment. This was a nice one. So that's quite low on the tank, but you can see those um, fragments there ricocheted off the floor and then back up into the engine, into the crew compartment. A lot of the fragments went straight into the ammo, so that brewed up right away. This one is good as well in next to the driver and then straight into the ammo rack next to him and you can see the m60 is just a giant ammo rack basically so a lot of the criticisms people level at, at the t72 until the abrams came along they were the same problems that western tanks had in fact western tanks usually had it worse because look at the height of an m60 compared to a t72 um it, it's a huge tank it's a massive target and all of that frontal surface area, all of it, is ammunition. 
and then the back of the turret muscle is all ammunition as well on the left side. So that's a lot of very explosive things to hit. Centurion's the same, the Leopard's the same, they all have ammunition either on one or both sides of the driver, and then ammunition stood around the base of the turret. So, you know, for all the talk about the, the T-72 being a death trap, um, unless you're in a, a proper hull-down dug-in position, which is what this is best at, it's not necessarily designed for it, but it's best at it, I would rather be in a T-72. Much rather be in a T-72. We caught that guy in the hop. You can see he was actually slamming the brakes right as I hit him because the front of the tank's kind of nosedived down. That went through the floor of the engine compartment, through a fuel tank, and then uh, shot debris out in every which direction. That one went into the engine directly. And then this one just cleaned through. You can see that that saber round just straight through the oh through the driver rather, and then through the commander's feet. That's uh, ouch, big ouch. How's the performance? In Gunner Heat PC, I'm pulling like 50, 60 frames on the big map with the settings cranked almost all the way up, so I'm pretty happy with that because this isn't optimized at all. I haven't tried DCS yet. We'll probably do that in a little while. Um, I think I should be okay with my track IR. So that window behind me causes this a lot of grief at the moment. I've got to get a proper curtain or get a blind or get that blind fixed. It's jammed. It won't come down. Um, the green screen probably does help block some of that, though. It's late enough in the afternoon. It's not coming straight in. I do something with the stream title real quick. Uh, sure, why not? How much ammunition does a tank really need anyway? Depends how long you're fighting. And depends what you're shooting as well. Like I said, most of their ammunition complement is high explosive. Uh, as a general rule, you can actually see the M60's ammunition complement is mostly heat, because it doesn't have HE. Um, it will get HEP at some point probably, but at the moment it's just Sabo and heat. But if you look at the ammunition on the T-55 and the T-72, it's majority HE because that was what was expected to be needed. They weren't planning and they didn't expect to run into an entire tank battalion in one go, you know. They expected to come across some tanks, um, but unless you were actually deliberately attacking a large armoured unit, you would mostly be carrying HE. Um, if you were expecting to attack a large armored unit head on, which is kind of, you know, not a great idea, but sometimes it has to happen, that's when you'd be loading majority Sabo or Heat. Ever play Steel Armor Blaze of War? Yeah, I've played it a little bit. Uh, I'd like to play it more, but I have trouble with the interface. It is very, very Russian. <laughs> but it's a really nice tank sim. In World War II, some memoirs said that they would just overstuff them. Yeah, um, that's also quite common practice with a lot of um, countries that use the T-72. They'll typically carry the spare ammunition filled, so the frontal ammunition rack in the, in the wet rack with the fuel tank, and then also around the inside of the tank. That's a bad idea. Um, some of them will overfill it. That's a really bad idea. And I think that was... Uh, that was one of the influencing factors in a number of the more spectacular T-72 losses in Syria. How is Beepsky Mark 1 doing in comparison? Beepsky Mark 1 was choking on this map. Uh, even on the smaller map with the settings turned down a bit, he was having trouble, but on the bigger map he was just choking. So, we've got a huge improvement already. If I go to launch OBS or the chatbot or whatever, it does it instantly, whereas it used to take quite a while. You know, it would take like 10-15 seconds, now it's just instant. Here's our next shot. Through the bottom of the tank, didn't do anything. Actually, it damaged one of the uh, torsion bars, it looks like, or an axle. That's about it. That's through the fuel tanks in the engine. You'll notice that the fuel tanks don't tend to catch fire. That's because fuel fires are generally overstated. Um, diesel in particular, but even petrol, is not as flammable as people think. 
Um, you know, generally, you need the tank to be partially empty. If it hits a full, uh, like a full tank, it's not going to combust. If it hits a partially empty tank, it will, because the, the vapor is what actually catches fire, right? Um, you have to aerosolize most fuels before they'll actually combust. Um, diesel in particular has to be aerosolized, it has to be at the right temperature, it, it, it's very fussy. Um, you know, that's part of the reason why diesel engines run at such high compression ratios by design. So generally in a tank, fuel fly is not that much of a concern, um, particularly if it's a T72 and the ammunition, or sorry, the fuel's mostly on the outside of the tank. Um, it'll just burn off and it's no concern to the fuel in or to, to the crew inside unless it flashes back through a fuel line. But ammunition is the big like fire source in a tank. Ammunition is what's going to screw you. So there we go, that's a HE round that actually hit one of the, the edge of one of the road wheels and damaged a bunch of the suspension parts. That was a heat round, which did a fair bit of damage. That was another HE round. Again, mostly did suspension damage, not a whole lot. Another HE. <clears throat> that did a whole lot of nothing, pretty much. Again, just did damage to the tracks and the suspension. That was, um, that's coming from the other T-72, I think. Not me, yeah. So he would have shot himself through all his, uh, all his Sabo and all his heat already. That's why he's firing HE. So then you've got another heat round from me here mostly went into the engine. I was aiming too far to the rear. Another HE round. Another heat round. This is from me again, into the engine mostly. This one went into the ammunition. That was a good shot. Straight into the ammunition. And then this, again, is the other tank. Surely here we should see where I ran out. I think. Maybe. We should see where I ran out of uh, anti-tank and went to HE. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. This one. Ooh. The, um, the loader ain't having any kids anytime soon. Yikes. Fucking yikes. And this was... All the way from over here, yeah, that's from my tank. And you can see just how relatively flat the heat shoots. The Sabo is even flatter. The, the, the Sabo is almost imperceptible in how it arcs at this range. I mean, that's a nearly a two kilometer shot. Hey, Lumber. Okay, so this was my HE round where I was trying to hit the turret bustle, so I was a little off with my aim. I'm curious if I could have actually um, sent a fragment into the ammunition if I hit it in the right place, but I guess we'll find out at some point or other. And then this is the uh, the final killing... Oh no, this is not the killing blow. That narrowly missed the ammunition. That went into his MG ammo. That was the killing blow right there, I think on him, and then that was the one on the last tank, so we're back to shot one of 29. There we go. Let's instead go and take an M60 up against the T-72 and get the shit kicked out of us, probably. Because the T-72 is very scary. <laughs> very, very scary. Activate the higher memory speed in the BIOS? Not yet. I'll have to do that later. I'll probably do that uh, this evening. Okay. Sure, the convoy lights are off because we don't need them. Put our thermals on. I am expecting to die very quickly here. Um, if you want to, like, DM me in Discord with whatever I need to change, because I am dumb potato brain, I'll do that this evening. So next stream we should see the improvement. I was mostly just focusing on getting shit working today. It took me an annoying amount of time to get the camera to work. 
I only just got it up and running before the stream. I'm very concerned by the fact I can't see anything yet. out which part of the tank I'm looking at. Oh, there we go. Okay, we hit him because he had his turret turned side on, I think. Another one. That should kill him. Or at least knock him out. comes ouch time. Uh oh. Shit. Can't reload. This is where I die. No, that's thermals. The uh, M60A3 is the TTS variant, which is like a cobbled on thermal site. <laughs> the M60 is a fantastic example of a stop gap gone overboard. So basically everything between the M26 Pershing and the Abrams was a stop gap of some sort or other. The M60A3 TTS specifically requires the commander to dump lead and undesignate. So the gunner can laze things, but the commander needs to undo the laze. It's not a well-designed system, it's just kind of clutched into the tank. Yeah, but the Spitfire Mark IX was a good stop cap. Well, a better stop cap. The M60 is not bad, it's just not that good. So my first round was quite high there. Didn't do a whole lot to him. That one was a little better, we took the commander's head off. Damaged the autoloader as well. So a couple fragments went into that. Then that one went through into the uh, ammunition there. That one went through his transmission, his brakes. That one went through the front plate, just barely. So what you can see here on the x-ray view, those pieces on the inside are just the Kvarts uh, sandwiching. The actual RHA, or sorry, cast armor, cast steel, um, that the Kvarts inserts are inside isn't shown on the X-ray. Only the composite itself is shown. So that's also why you see that sort of gap there, is because it's showing the um, textilite. I think it shows the outer layer of RHA on the hull, and then it shows the textilite. I don't think it shows the inner layer. And then that was the, the round that fucked my loader right there. So that was heavily wounded, it said. That was heavily wounded. So he's had shrapnel, low energy shrapnel mostly, hit him in the leg, left leg, and in the upper torso and the uh, in the chin. If any of the yellow stuff had touched him, he probably would have been dead. And you can see them just firing at me there. And then that was the one that knocked me out right there because it went straight into the ammo rack. Let's try that mission again.
The APHE on the T55 is beastly. It's my favorite thing in the game. Um, it won't penetrate an M60's turret very well from the front. It will penetrate the hull from close range. But if you get around into the side of the M60 with the BR-412D, it will just rat fuck the entire tank and everyone in it. Like, one round will kill everything. It's... oh, So good. So, so good. So if you can, uh, if you can do some sneaky sneaky and ambush the M60 and get a BR-412 into the side of it, it's just a monstrous amount of damage that thing does. I'm gonna get four person together for War Thunder tanks, I'm all for it. I usually play alone in War Thunder because I tend not to play that much. I'll play a couple games here and there, I'll tab out between rounds, I just kind of play at my own pace. War Thunder is something that I play every now and then when I'm really bored and I really need a T64 fix. Once this gets a T64, I'll be playing it all otherwise. Driver definitely has the best chance of survival, it seems. It depends. Um, especially, like, if you've got any sort of rolling hills in the terrain, the driver probably will survive because the turret's going to be what the other tank sees. I see you, but I can't tell which end of the tank I'm looking at, so I don't want to take the shot yet. Um, so statistically speaking, and this is backed up by multiple studies done by uh, both the US and the Soviets after the war, amongst other countries, the bottom meter or so of a tank is very unlikely to get hit. Like, it's single digits percentage chance of getting hit in the bottom meter or so of your tank. And this is why lower front plates tend to be just RHA and they tend not to be very thick. It's why Soviet tanks are so squat to the ground. Um, they were intentionally designed to be as low to the ground as possible. And it's why hull down is such a thing. Because an enemy tank gunner is going to shoot from the center of scene mass more often than not. And that's going to be your turret ring. Or if you're hull down, it's going to be your turret. Um, typically around the mantlet, which is, you know, the thickest armor on the entire tank, usually. So I'm not blocked by these trees in front of me. Oh, he sees something. That's bad news. There's the auto loot. Auto lead system doing some good work there. Okay, he's dead. killed and there goes the tank <laughs> they're coming out of the trees I can't see them we'll try and reposition somewhere else yeah the turret can pop off the m60 it does quite often so what um, influences the turret popping or not is how much ammunition is in the tank how quickly it's burning whether the hatches are all dogged down or not it's basically a, a build-up of pressure inside the tank from the fire, and the only place that explosion can go is up. Um, if it can go somewhere else, like out the hatches, it will. If it can go out a penetration hole in the side of the tank, it will. But if it cannot get out of the tank any other way, it'll build up pressure and just pop the top off the tank. Um, theoretically, any tank should be able to pop its turret. It's just based on pressure, and in pretty much every case, tank turrets are just sitting on the hull by weight. Um, you know, they just sit on a, a turret race by their own weight. Sometimes there'll be like a, a metal clip or something to hold it in place, but they're not that securely fastened to the tank. Much like when a battleship capsizes, the turrets fall out. For the exact same reason, they're just sitting on the, uh, on the bull races because they're too heavy to really do anything else with. I see you. Barely. We 
We hit him and we damaged him, but he's still going. Oh, there's another one. Okay, he's fucked. Hit throwing charge, he's probably gonna blow up. Probably. We'll see. Yep, there he goes. Ooh, that's a nice big explosion right there. There he goes. You can see what a huge advantage the M60 has, both at night and in uh, really heavily wooded terrain. The thermal sight makes it much easier to spot T-72s, whereas the T-72 still only has an early night vision device, um, it has no thermals whatsoever. The Soviets were quite late to put thermals in their tanks, they're quite late to get thermals in general. Um, they kind of focused on other technologies, and thermal optics fell by the wayside. Oh shit, hello. Killed my loader. But I think that's going to be a mutual kill, possibly. Because we hit him in a... Well, maybe not. We hit him in a propellant casing. Or I guess it decided not to blow up. I'm curious where he's hitting me. He's not really doing much to me at the moment. Hey, we finally got one loaded. So if your load is killed, it takes a long time to reload the gun. And we just got popped. Something uh, the more observant of you may have noticed is that the T-72's proper reload animations aren't done yet. So as well as chucking the case stub out the back, it should also elevate the gun to a couple degrees above the horizontal to load. Um, all Soviet MBTs do that. A lot of European ones do as well. The Challenger does it, um, both Challenger 1 and 2. Uh, I think... The Leopard might, but I'm not sure. But um, the T-72, once it's fired around, the gun will raise by a couple of degrees. I think it's like three degrees or something. Indexes, loads, and then comes back down to the point of aim. Let's go ahead and look at the after action report. So my first shot was at a really sketchy angle. My next one was much better. So it went through. The upper front plate. You see most of the uh, spooling off hitting that plate was stopped by the back piece of RHA, but enough got through that it went into the carousel. So the hull armor on the T-72 is very good, but it's not uh, stand up to an M833 good. Not at this range. From further away, yes, but from less than a kilometer, not really. That one was through the lower front plate. That was actually a pretty brutal one it went straight through the bottom half of the driver there we had one piece of shrapnel go into the carousel and the next one went straight through the carousel that was a kill that shot was ah see this is the guy i took a panic shot at and i shot high so it went through right next to the gunner's primary sight which is that uh, big periscope housing, you can see that's the GPS on the T-72. GPS in this context, gun as primary sight. Um, the sight behind it with the cover over is the night vision sight for the gunner, and then the commander has his own little IR spotlight there. I don't remember if the commander has his own night vision optics in this, I don't think so, I could be wrong. Um, he does have magnified daytime uh, optics, so I know that much. So that went through a bit high, and it Looks like it kind of scooched under the gunner's helmet and then went straight into the spare ammo at the back of the turret. Ah, ah, but you see what happens here. It's actually penetrated not a propellant, like a, a throwing charge, but it's penetrated a Sabre rounds propellant and it hasn't gone off. So that's why he didn't blow up despite being hit in the ammunition. Then yeah, he uh, killed my loader straight off the bat. 
Sabo ran through the bottom half of his torso, that would have cut him in half. And a whole bunch more shots. You can see he was just kind of hitting empty space. He was hitting with either the uh, the, load, the loader's already dead body, or he was hitting nothing, pretty much. Just going straight through and out the other side. And then eventually, eventually he gets one into the ammunition. Which probably would have been that last one that I had there. Yeah. Into there, actually. That went into the ammunition. That's what killed me. Try it again. Why is an M113 with a 248 again, out against T-72s? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's just there as like a kind of a, hey, they're over here sort of scouting unit. Now, the BRDM would actually be doing that kind of thing, because BRDM's a reconnaissance vehicle. That's what the R stands for. But yeah, for a for an M113, for a bucket, I'm not sure. Now, when the Bradley comes out, it will probably be doing that role, because, you know, it was partly built for reconnaissance. These trees are killing me. Pause this and catch up on chat for a second, Ooh. without the loud noises in the background. Sometimes it just tore the hole open and tore the hole open in half, like some of Sherman T thirty four pictures show. Yeah, it depends on the quality of the welds, the force of the explosion. Um, but it's harder to model that in a game. It's a much more involved process than just chucking the turret. So. I'd like to see that. Uh, I'd like to see tanks getting totally demolished, but I don't think we will, to be honest. Has any crew survived having their turret blown off? I don't know. I suspect if they did, they'd probably be missing at least some limbs. In the future, the 113s will be able to drop off infantry as well, so the infantry will be able to act as uh, reconnaissance units. Which will be quite nice when it happens. get rolled up on by that same guy. So when the T-72 is pushing on you with its turret pointed at you like he had, best place to hit it, if you can't see its hull, is in the cheeks of the turret right next to the gun, like right next to the gun mantlet, because the uh, parts doesn't cover that. DCS when? DCS shortly, that's when. Okay, he's burning. That's ammunition smoldering. Yeah, he's jumped. Okay. We are good. Thanks to the resub, by the way. Appreciate it. 
I appreciate you guys sticking around and being patient with me. I know this new PC build and move has taken a lot longer than uh, it reasonably should have. I do apologize for that, but it was a little more stressful than I expected. But we're back into it now. Hopefully it should be all up from here. I didn't even see where that one came from. Oh, the physics are a little janky at the moment. So what happened there was the turret hit the tank hull and tried to force the tank hull to flip and it hit the tree. Um, the tank hulls probably don't act quite as heavy as they should, so to speak, because the turrets will quite easily throw them around if they hit them. But yeah. Oh, he was right there. He was right fucking there. Son of a bitch. Well, we got a couple of them at least. So we got him. That one skipped off the turret ring actually. I'm surprised. That barely grazed his turret. I'm actually surprised that that first of all made it through without shattering or ricocheting and second of all I mean it's very thin armor on the roof of the turret but still and I'm also very surprised that it actually uh, managed to hit the propellant and set it off again it hit the um, saber rounds the propellant and the saber rounds not the actual carousel again the hazards of carrying loose ammo inside the tank right if he hadn't been carrying that and was only carrying what was in the carousel that wouldn't have been an issue I wouldn't have been able to kill him there you know, at worst, I would have maybe killed the gunner. Um, it looks like the gunner was wounded there, but not killed. And then I got a round into him. Another one there. And then that was the round that killed me. Oh, yeah. No wonder I didn't see him. I wasn't even looking in that direction. That was a nice shot. It's a really nice shot. Curious how many tanks were out here. Um, I think there were four T-72s in that mission, four or five. It may have been a couple more. Let's try another one. Um, hold the line. I suspect this might be an M60 mission from the name. Let me just turn the light on in here because it's gonna get dark. Yeah, M60 mission, I thought so. I thought it might be. See, we're down to 24, 25 frames a second here, but this is the larger map. It's very resource intensive, and I have got my settings pretty much cranked. And also, again, this is totally unoptimized because it's very early development. Oh god. Oh no. No, this is, this is the big bad. Body over there got one of them at least. There we go. Now something about the M60's fire control system is it can account for lead but it can't account for your own movement. So if you're moving when you take a shot, you have to manually add the difference. Whereas the Abrams, it does both, I believe. Well, there goes a tow. There must be a uh, infantry tow launcher somewhere here. That'll come in for sure. Yeah, there we go. It's down there. Sneaky bastards. Thank you. 
There we go. We held the line. That's a toe you can see up there. The um, AI change targets with the toes if their target's destroyed by something else, or if they lose sight on it. They also prioritize targets, so whatever's pointing its gun at them is highest priority. Um, and after that, I think it's whatever's closer. So we can now go to the after action report and have a look. So that first shot was, ooh, oof. That, uh, that did some very unpleasant things to this tank. And this is one of the trade-offs of the Soviet MBTs. They're very small, they're very, very compact targets, which means you have a much lighter tank for the same or better amount of armor protection. Um, you can take one of the crew members out, and again, having more armor to protect more members of the crew and more internal volume means more weight. So they basically had much better protection for their weight than NATO tanks did because they got away with removing that crew member and they downsized the tank. This is the trade-off. If anything penetrates that tank, it is fucked. You know, a NATO tank might survive a penetrating hit, it's not going to be pretty, but it might survive it. Whereas a T-72, if a round comes inside the fighting compartment, pretty good odds it's going to kill all or most of the crew and or blow the tank up. Um, it's a trade-off you make. Your tank's very small, it's a very hard nut to crack, but if something gets through it, it's just dead. Forget about it. You can actually see where this uh, Sabre around here penetrated across four different road wheels and each time it hit one of the road wheels it would throw fragments which would then go into the next one. It looks pretty cool. And you can actually see as well if you look, um, it penetrates the rubber tires on the road wheel and then stops at the actual steel rim. Is this armor? No, this is Gunner Heat PC. Uh, the reason it's in the Armour 3 category is because it doesn't have its own. It's a uh, very early development indie game, but I figured anyone who's into Armour would probably be into this. So that one was a non-penetration. That was actually a Sabre round that got crushed into the thin armour there and stopped. I'm very lucky it did, because that could have been very ugly if it went through. Oh... That's a tow. So that tow, oh my god, that tow missile, look at this, actually went down the barrel of the T-72's gun. Went straight down the barrel of his gun. Into the gun breech. And the gun breech must have been open. He was loading. <sighs> Oof. He was loading his gun as this toe came in through his gun barrel, fused on the autoloader, or on the, like, yeah, on the autoloader, and the back face of the turret, entered fighting compartment, hit autoloader, penetrated autoloader, detonated on impact, penetrated turret, hit warhead, penetrated warhead, which in itself would be enough to probably kill the tank, hit gun breach housing, hit gunner's right arm, penetrated gunner's right arm, hit throwing charge, that would kill the tank as well, penetrated throwing charge, penetrated ammo carousel side shield, which is uh, that one fragment that kind of dog legs off the engine there, ricochets back into it, um, hit commander's left arm, penetrated, hit propellant casing and penetrated, hit coaxial PKT, uh, which is over there on the commander's side. So, kind of on the right side of the turret as I'm looking at it now, as a fragment. Hit commander's left leg, penetrated. Hit gunner's right leg, penetrated. Hit gunner's left leg, penetrated. Penetrated ammo carousel, top shield. Hit gunner's torso, penetrated. Hit gunner's gut, left arm, penetrated. Hit commander's torso, penetrated commander's vision block, penetrated commander's spotlight. Hit gunner's head, penetrated uh, gunner's skull. Hit Gunner's right eye, which you can actually see there, that's a yellow fragment. So he had a fragment come in uh, from his right side, right like behind his temple, penetrate through his skull, it missed his brain so it didn't dig in that deep, but it went through his skull and then went out through his eye. Probably took off part of his nose as well. 
Not that it matters, because that tank brewed up anyway. So if that didn't kill him, the tank exploding like half a second later did. But that's... That's something. That's the first time I've ever seen that. I mean, well, because we didn't have the T uh, T72 until now that we could play. But that that toe went in through his gun barrel while he was reloading and detonated inside the turret. I've never seen it do that before. I've seen tank shells go down and hit the gun breach and detonate, but I've never seen one actually come in through an open breach while the tank was reloading. That is fucking spectacular. That's really something. That's a hell of a shot from the toe gunner. That was a nearly four kilometer shot, 3,714.6 meters. That toe shot, right there. You can see he made a little correction there, that little S bend in it, it's correcting all the way. And then straight over the top, top couple branches of that tree, He's lucky because if he'd hit one of the main branches, it probably would have uh, detonated. But then straight into the tank. That's really something. Then this one was, uh, that was another shot at me. That actually shattered, possibly? It stopped on the upper plate. It may have even shattered at that kind of angle. Sabo rounds do not like steep angles. Uh, War Thunder does model shattering, but it doesn't model it enough. Most of the higher tier tanks in War Thunder should not ever be penetrated by a Sabo round through their upper front plate unless the shot comes from above them. Because when you hit a, about a 70, 80 degree slope with a Sabo round, it's just going to shatter. It's going to hit it and split into pieces and then ricochet upwards like that. Again, stopped by front plate. And at that range too, at nearly four kilometers, that round has run out of a lot of energy. It's still moving real fast, but it's running out of energy at that kind of range. You know, that's the upper limit of where you're going to effectively be able to engage something with a Sabo, uh, not least because it's a challenge hitting something, unless it's perfectly stationary. So, that one didn't make it through. That one actually did, so I did get penetrated there. I think that's me. Or is that the other guy? Either way, this tank got penetrated, but it just crushed into the bottom of the tank and ricocheted out the bottom. Didn't damage anything. I hear we have a good one. So this is a Sabre round. This is an M833. Comes in from four kilometers, just under, 3,900 meters. Comes in through the first level of, or the, the first layer rather of RHA, through the textilite, and then it hits the backing plate of RHA and just ricochets up through the top and uh, comes to a rest there in the composite armor doesn't actually do anything to the tank. That might have been the other AI, I think. That, I'm pretty sure I didn't get my engine knocked out, so that must have been the other guy. I think I was uh, down there somewhere, or down there somewhere. I don't know. I don't remember. Then there was this guy, he got sledged through his carousel. So that came in through the driver's viewport cutout. You'll see there's, if you look on the, um, the surface of the tank, there's a cutout that you can actually see around the driver's viewport. And if we look in the interior view, that's because it's just RHA. There's no composite there at all, and it's quite thin RHA. Um, so it just goes straight through that and uh, does very unpleasant things to the tank. These tow gunners, man. That one nearly went down the gun barrel too. And you can see, <laughs> I think this is the one where I hit right at the same time the tow did. Um, so the tow goes in, actually detonates right there outside the armor, forms a heat jet, which goes through most of the um, fragments bounce off the front of the turret, but you can actually see the heat jet manages to squeeze through next to the textilite. So you'll see there's quite a broad gap by the side of the gun where there's no textilite filler. Or sorry, quartz filler. It's quartz in the turret, it's textilite in the hull. Um, it went past the quartz through the cast armor on the turret, which is thinner, 
um, and it's only cast armor, it's, it's, it's not composite, and it just went clean through the tank. So if you look at the outside of the tank, um, there's quite a broad area around the gun, basically right up to the uh, edge of the smoke canisters, the, uh, the smoke dispensers. That's where the armor starts, the actual proper composite armor on both sides. So it's quite vulnerable if you hit right near the gun, but if you hit the turret cheeks, you're not going to get through a lot of the time. What game is this? This is Gunner Heat PC. It's not Armor 3. I'm in the Armor 3 category because Gunner Heat PC is an indie game in very early development. It doesn't have its own category, but it's a simulator. So anyone who's into armor will probably be into this. The RHS guys have done some impressive stuff with tanks in Armor 3, but this is a whole other level of simulation. This is like probably about on par with Steel Beast in terms of how it actually simulates the tanks themselves. Um, it has some more simplified elements. It's meant to be an accessible simulator. So, you know, you have third person to drive around in. Um, the gun sight will automatically you know, reposition to whatever kind of ammunition's in the gun. You don't have to manually switch it like you do in, say, RHS T-72. Um, but the actual damage models, the ballistics, all of that is simulation level. Like, full-on simulation level. So again, um, Kvarts is only any good if you hit the Kvarts, if you hit the steel, the cast steel, it just goes straight through. So, for those who aren't familiar, the Kvarts, as the name might suggest, is uh, like a quartz filler, like um, quartz uh, crystals, I guess, arranged into a matrix, and then they just use that to fill the inside of the, um, the cast armor. And the Textilite is kind of like a, a plasticky, fiberglassy material. Thank you, Alexa Simp, for the follow. And Recruit Rusa and anyone else I missed. Uh, I need to buy myself a new second monitor. I haven't got around to that yet, so I'm using my phone like a pro streamer. And then that was, uh, yeah, that would have been for the other AI because I didn't get killed. So yeah, that was the, uh, the AI M60. You know, a shot from me there, which is off angle, just ricocheted down the side armor of the tank and through the suspension. There you go. There you go. That's a good one. So, this toe came in. So, these are out of sequence because the time to fly to the toe is so long, right? The toe fired first, but I hit first. So, my round that actually hit penetrated through the upper front plate, uh, through the driver's right leg and out his spine, or like out his back basically, not out his spine, but out his uh, pelvis on the right side. The actual saber itself mushed into the floor of the tank, but a bunch of um, spalling and shrapnel went straight through the ammo carousel and hit a throwing charge somewhere in there. In fact, it looks like the carousel was mostly empty at the time, so it hit a throwing charge near the back, I would say. It probably hit one of the ones right in the back of the carousel. Possibly the one that was ready to be loaded into the gun. So that was what actually popped the turret. But then if we go back, the toe hit after the turret was already popped. And you can see the turrets <laughs> out of here, man. See you later. And uh, that toe actually hit at a very sort of sketchy angle onto the, the rear decking of the tank. It looks like it actually hit the turret ring and detonated just kind of on the engine decking. And then threw a lot of fragments into the engine, just rat fuck the engine compartment. But it also threw some shrapnel back towards the front of the tank. Some of them bounced, you see these bouncing off the top of the carousel? That's because the carousel has an armored shield above it. So they ricocheted off that armored shield, which you can't actually see in this view because it's not modeled. Um, in that view. So the tank interiors are very basic, it's, it's pretty much just says something to see if the turret pops. They're not full interiors yet, and you can see there's gaps in the uh, in the 3D model, because they're just so you can see the inside of the turret when it pops. 
Full interiors would be nice, but with a team of six or seven, so I think it's seven now, and one full time, it's not really feasible. Maybe in the future if they can pick up more team members, pick up more funding and more time, once the core game's finished, it might happen, but it's not planned for now. So anyway, we can see those ricochet off the, um, the shield at the top of the carousel and stop in the front of the turret ring. And then another couple fragments come back from that explosion and straight through the driver's neck, through his upper spine, come out through his chest. One of them ricochets through his kneecap and then into his shoe, like into his, um, you know, through his boot into his foot. And they both stop in the inner surface of the lower front plate as the turret's flying out of the tank. Toe avoiding mechanism, yeah. And that one, that was the shot that actually caused that turret to pop. This, that's an interesting shot, that's a Sabo round. Kind of came down, hit next to the gun, ricocheted off the inner surface of the gun mounting, off the uh, gun breech. The, actually, I stand corrected. The Sabo itself was stopped by the gun breech, but the shrapnel it created was thrown down by a ricochet into the top of the carousel and it actually penetrated and hit a throwing charge. So that was what killed him. This guy just got turbo fucked by a toe. And again, it came in right under the gun. The, the toe gunners aim for center of mass, so you know if the gun's pointed right at them, they're gonna hit the gun. But again, because there's no Kvarts filler right next to the gun, it went straight through and just absolutely wrecked that tank. Then we got a shot that came in through this guy's side and uh, did a number of bad things to him. That would have killed him. The other guy ramming him from behind because the AI are not the best drivers. It looks like he's actually clipped into that tree a little. It's a work in progress, guys. It's, it's very early days. Very early days, yeah. And then uh, that was another one at the other AI because I didn't take a single penetrating hit the whole time, I don't think. So he was well and truly screwed there. I think that would have knocked him out. Actually, um, some of the fragments nearly hit the tow gunner behind him. And then that was the killing blow on the last guy. Went in through the, kind of on the edge of the composite armor for the driver, and then straight into the ammo rack next to him. So that's that. We'll try one more in the T-72, I think. Injection system for two out of three to crew. Yeah, really. Um... 72 sniper is quite long range and I tend to get my shit wrecked in it, but we'll try it again. Long range stuff with the T72 is quite hard because you don't have that automatic lead function that the uh, M60 does or the T64 and T80. Again, because I'm on a slope surface, it's going to screw with my accuracy a little. Short. I was on for lead, but I was a little short. Tracked him, I think. You can really see how the smoke affects visibility. And this is main gun barrel damage. I don't think I'm going to be able to fire now. Um, this is something a lot of people don't realize, is that battlefields are really smoky. You can't see very well. Even on training exercises, let alone an actual full-blown war, you can't see very well at all. There's smoke everywhere, there's explosions, there's vehicles burning, there's grass burning from tracers lighting fires. You know, tracers are... Tracers light things on fire, my dudes. There was a really bad bushfire started out by Lithgow a couple of years ago now. That was because the army were training on a really bad fire danger day and a tracer got into the bush and lit it. Um, likewise, one of my section commanders at Kapuka lit about half of Coltana on fire because of a tracer round going into the scrub during the summer. 
so you really notice things like that here. Yeah, we've lost the gun. I'll have to restart the mission. Which engine are they using? Unity. So it's uh, it's Unity, but they've done everything else themselves in-house. So all the um, ballistic stuff. They've got a fancy little um, like interface that they showed in the Patreon channel, which actually allows them to program in new armor materials very quickly and easily. It's quite impressive. The log does have its own armor profile. Uh, as do flesh, bone, various parts of the body, um, different kinds of steel between mild steel, armor steel, track steel, things like that. They all have different armor profiles. It's really, really something, guys. I'm really excited for this. Stop my terrain, bro. That looked like a good shot to me. We should have given that a little bit more lead, but I think we've detracked him at least. Cow lost, commander killed, and burnt. Where did that come through? Ah, through the driver's viewport. Yeah. Restart again. So you can see the um the T72 is very strong, but it's also very vulnerable in certain situations. You know, people kind of come into things with the War Thunder mindset that, or the, the, the gamer mindset that this tank trumps that tank 100% of the time because it's just better. And there's no way my tank could possibly lose to his tank. This is like the jerk. Whoops, we'll restart because I accidentally negligently discharged. Um, you know, this is why people say Germany suffers in War Thunder. It doesn't. It really fucking doesn't. It's because they're bad. They don't know how tanks work and they think just because the Tiger has a lot of fucking documentaries documentaries singing its praises on the history channel um that it's invulnerable it's not it's not you can kill a tiger with you know a light tank fuck you can kill a tiger with an auto cannon if you hit it in the right place like that's the important thing is to know your own tank so you don't get it blown up in an embarrassing fashion and just like any tank the t72 has its strengths and it has its weaknesses and as you guys saw those weaknesses are particularly around the driver's viewport and also either side of the gun, where the Kvarts doesn't have coverage. There you go. I think we tracked him. We'll rearrange him, because I'm not real sure that laser is accurate. Okay, there we go. We'll give him another. That's definitely a kill. He tracked him again. The angle they're approaching me at is quite awkward. So I'm hitting them in the side a lot. I'm detracking them quite easily, but it makes it very difficult to kill them. Bring the aim point up a little so I can try and penetrate him through the turret. There we go. I'm probably aiming too low on these M60s. The M60's turret armor is quite strong against the T55, but against the T72, it's a joke. You know, I should have no real problem penetrating their turrets, even at this range. Oh, we're out of ammo. Time for heat, I guess. This has a longer flight time, so it's a slower round. I'm going to have to lead them a hell of a lot more. I'm probably not going to hit them at this range with heat. Just because it is so slow. Please stop moving. Oh, God damn it. The other one's pushing on me. Probably hit him too much there. Oh, just... All right, let's ignore him since he's retreating. We'll refocus the uh, M60 that's pushing me. I'm coming out of my, my um, partial hull down position here, but I need a better field of fire on this guy. That looks pretty good. It was pretty good, holy shit. Perfect shot. Okay, this guy's coming back now. Oh, and we need to actually reload totally because we are empty. So I'm going to retreat, 
at the incredible reverse speed of the T-72. Um, in Soviet doctrine, tanks weren't expected to tactically reverse. They were expected to push ahead. Um, it, not because of the, you know, not one step back fucking NKVD memes, but more just because Soviet doctrine was fast and violent, and they emphasized rapid pushes to be within point-blank range of the enemy. Um, the Soviet kind of doctrine for armored pushes was to be on top of the enemy position within two to three minutes of taking fire. They would advance in column at maximum speed. As soon as the first shot came in, they'd form into line and then just charge. And they would not fire and maneuver below, below the, uh, I think it was the... It was the company level, from memory. So they really focused on just speed, aggression, violence, and uh, stupid fucking mistakes, man. Which I quite like. That's that's the kind of doctrine I like to play with. Thank you, Jack Stoll, for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Hope you're enjoying it. We'd see it's up for sim stuff. I think Unity is what Squad uses as well, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong, I think it's Unity. Actually, no, it might be Unreal. I don't know. Unity can do whatever you want. Um, like, this is the thing, a lot of people kind of rag on Unity because a lot of, like, low-effort games are made with it. But you get out what you put in. It's, it's the same as any game engine. I've seen people do some incredible stuff with really ancient engines. You just get out what you put in. Sure, you have hard limits in some engines, especially older ones, but... If you are willing to put in the time and the effort and find some creative workarounds where you need to, you can get some really good results out of whatever engine you want. I feel like Flight Sims could use one of these commercial engines and finally have something that isn't un an unoptimized mess. You would think, you would actually think, I'm kind of surprised no one's done it yet. I'm curious why. I'm sure there's a reason. Um, probably just entrenched, oh no, that's not what we do here kind of practice, but I'm curious why. Yeet. Okay, where's this last M60? You may also notice the T-72 doesn't have great gun elevation or depression because it's a massive gun. Like, you can see the size of the breech of it in the X-ray view. It's a huge gun. It takes up a lot of space in the turret, and the turret's quite squat. Oh, this is going to be painful. Delta D doing its magic here. We're a touch low, I'm going to relays. Sabo again. The hill cant is affecting my shots a bit, so I'm going to bring it over. There we go. That was the killing shot. Yeah, M60 A1 with 70s ammo would suffer badly against the T72. Um, so the... The kind of planned time period, the initial time period, they want to introduce more theatres later depending on the success of the game, but the planned uh, theatre for Gunner Heat PC at release is Centag 1985, so that's the Americans and the West Germans fighting the East Germans and the group of Soviet forces in Germany. So you can expect to see early Abrams, you can expect to see Bradleys, BMP1s, 1Ps, possibly... Uh, no, we won't probably see BMP2s. I think the 2 was 86 that entered widespread service, from memory. Um, you'll be seeing things like that. So you will see the more advanced ammo in the M60. Um, you'll see, like for instance, the T55 is carrying a really impressive diversity of ammo that I don't think would have ever been loaded historically. Um, you know, in, instead of just Sabo, Heat, and HE, we also have the BR-412. But I'm really glad that we have the BR-412 because it's the, f the most fun thing in this entire game to use. Um, so they do make little adjustments here and there just for more fun. Um, kind of like DCS does, just not to the same extreme, I would say. 
Going to War Thunder with the opposite mindset, regularly take 75mm Sherman up against Tigers and Panthers and do decently. Avoid head on fights, use hardcover and try to make sure they're hitting me somewhere angled. I remember one of the first kills I got with the Sherman 105 was I wedged an HE round into the bottom of the turret bustle on a King Tiger and it just immediately shot shrapnel down into the fuel tanks and brewed it up. He was so mad. Fire in the move, yep. Although it's quite hard to hit because, especially in this case, you don't have auto lead, but you also don't have that automatic accounting for your own movement. Again, that's something that came with the M1. T64B is going to be so nice when it eventually happens. Uh, unfortunately, T64s are a bit delayed at the moment. It's very hard for them to get good scans. So what they're doing, for those that missed me talking about this before, was they're taking uh, photogrammetric scans of real tanks to get basically the shape of the tank, the size, the proportions, the different external equipment. They don't use that in game because it's like 20 million polygons and it's also kind of jagged and bumpy because it's, you know, the software is not perfect. It's new technology, relatively speaking. Same way that Google Earth gets uh, 3D models of the Earth's surface, right? Like if you can go into a city, say like New York or London or whatever, and you see everything's in 3D and you can even read billboards, that's the same thing. They use uh, photogrammetric scanning to, to do that. So what they use these models for is they'll actually build the in-game model on top of it so they can make sure all the proportions are right, all the different components are in the right places because a lot of the time um, publicly available drawings of these tanks are not correct or there was some modification made in service that never found its way back onto the um, original schematics. So. Um, they've got good scans for a number of vehicles, and basically whether they can get good scans is dictating what gets into the game um, when. And the T-64, unfortunately. The T-64A also has the added problem that uh, they've got to figure out how to do a coincidence rangefinder without halving the frame rate, so you've got to render the same image twice to get the two halves of it to line up, right? That's how a coincidence rangefinder works. It's got, basically like battleships have, so you've got two mirrors, um, in like a wide bar that pops out either side of the turret and it uses the, the the like stereoscopic difference between those two mirrors to pretty much you overlay them onto each other on the gun side and you have to line them up and when the two halves line up that means the two mirrors are pointed correctly to get the stereoscopic view like you like you know the same way humans see things in 3d that's basically what it's doing uh, you, you need two points of reference, so you can basically do trigonometry to work out what the range is. Our brain does that automatically, we don't even have to think about it. It's pretty incredible. Um, so you use that to line up the images, and then once you've done that, you know what the range is, because you've got the range from the angle of the, um, the mirrors. But to do that in game, you have to render the image twice, and doing that without killing the frame rate, especially in a game that is at the moment not at all optimized, um, that's going to be interesting. So I've got to work that one out. The T64B, that's not a problem because it has a, com well, analog computer fire control system. Um, and in that case, it also has a laser rangefinder, so it's not a problem there. But the issue with the T64B is, again, scans and various other things. Um, these guys are really going all in on this. They are going for proper documents. Um, you know, if people come in and say, oh, well, this tank should be able to defeat this tank because so-and-so said so, or if they say, oh, I have a document, it's like, can you show us? Um, it, it's a full-on sim. They are really, really going hard for the accuracy in this. It's really impressive. Anyway, here's our first shot. Hit him in the track, so that's what stopped him. The next one was low, hit him in the uh, running gear. That one narrowly missed his ammo. It actually screwed the crew over, so it badly wounded the driver, but it somehow missed the ammo, just barely. You can actually see one of those fragments went between two propellant cases, so that was very close. And then that one went straight into the ammo, that was the killing shot right there. Again, I'm hitting at kind of a sketchy angle. That did send some fragments through the armor, but they were stopped by the firewall, they didn't really do anything, but it did detrack him. And then I was able to put a shot through the floor, which screwed him up. You can see here, 
the crew have already partly jumped, so the loader's the only one still in there. Which is interesting. It may be because he was wounded in the legs, and now he's got, you know, I'd say his, his feet were cut off by that one. So he's still in the tank when it blows, whereas the other crew got out because the hatches were open. That shot was uh, not very effective. It didn't even track him. It just kind of skipped off the back of the engine there. That was a very effective shot. That was a very, very effective shot. That was a heat round straight through his ammo rack. Then that was uh, that was a near miss for me. That was a very near miss for me. If that had been about two or three inches lower, that could have killed me. Because it could have ricocheted down around the back into the spare ammunition. That was a bit low, that was a bit low. That was into the fuel tanks in the engine. Again, that one's into the running gear. And you can see that's a heat round. It fused on the uh, road wheel there. It did send a jet through to the other side, but it wasn't very effective. Detract. Oh, we're back into the start. Okay, never mind. We'll do one more mission. Um, we'll do the valley mission again, because I quite like that one. Oops. Did I click quit game or quit mission? I forget. Either way, uh, whoopsie. Maybe we won't do one more. I'll tell you what, let's get set up and we'll try some DCS. Give me a minute here because I've got to rearrange my desk slightly. Streamer, by the way. figure out where I can put my phone that I'll still be able to read chat. I'll just have to put it on the desk. Oh, it'll be a huge difference. It won't be as huge, but it'll still be huge. I'll just make it even better when I do get around to sorting out the RAM. Um, I'm sure I'm getting cut off a lot. It's because my screen's a bit closer than it used to be. My whole setup is totally different on this desk. First light going to be for MiG-21. How did you know? How did you guess that? What gave it away? Let me just go to the waiting screen for a second while DCS gets up and running, if it wants to be up and running. Looks like there's a small patch. Are you seriously going to ask me? God damn it, UAC. I need to sort that out. It pings me every time I start the chatbot for the stream. It also pings me anytime Steam tries to update DCS. So I need to not disable it, but I need to stop it from doing that specifically because it's very annoying. In fact, you know what? I probably could disable it. Now the other thing is, to play DCS I have to move back from the desk a little because I don't want to smack my knees on the support beam that runs under this thing. So I quite like this desk, but the, um, the downside is that it sits several inches lower to the ground than my previous one. I didn't actually realise until after I put it together, so I have to sit much further back to avoid injuring myself and it may cause the um, camera to see around the edges of the green screen, so you'll have to bear with me. In fact, um, while DCS launches, let me adjust that now. Okay, I think we're good. Actually, it, it seems like it's better off now that I'm further from the camera. 
problem is I'm also further away from my screen and my keyboard, so I have to lean in if I need to use the keyboard for something. And uh, spotting things in the distance is going to be a little more difficult. I've still got to tweak this setup a lot. What I'll probably do is find a way to prop up my desk a little. Um, I'll have to make sure it's pretty solid because the desk wobbles a bit when I'm playing DCS. But um, I'll try and prop it up a little so I can sit in my normal position much closer to the screen. Because it just feels weird sitting all the way back here. And it messes with my track IR a little as well. Ever tell you guys how IL-2 probably saved my life? Sounds like a story. I could tell you how uh, F-22 Total Air War and Falcon 4 nearly made me repeat a year of school. Whoop, whoop, whoopsies. I'm back to sitting crooked like I used to because my um my pedals are slightly off center. I need to move them. In fact, you know what? Let me do that right now. You may hear me banging around under the desk and swearing. Bear with me. Yeah, that's about lined up with the screen, I think. Close enough. I think I've um, plugged something in wrong in the case because the RGB function buttons don't actually appear to... Which is, I mean, it's good that it's stuck on solid colour because if it was like doing different patterns it would be really distracting but it's just a solid orange colour and it looks really cool from the front. <laughs> Where did you move to? Down by Canberra. So I'm much closer to my sister now so we can actually hang out. And I'm also closer to Civilization than I was in Bathurst. Much closer. I mean, Civilization's a strong word to use for anywhere in this country, but it is what it is. Yeah, still in Australia. Oh, it's going to be a long time before I can afford to get out of this place, for sure. And there's other concerns too, like I don't want to move too far away from the family at the moment. I would love to go home, but uh, it's not going to happen right away. And at the moment it would be a very bad idea considering how badly uh, Canada, particularly Alberta, is going with the whole COVID thing. Okay, that's interesting. Multiplayer is greyed out even though I'm logged in. Streaming early? Yeah, I decided to do an afternoon stream. Well, afternoon my time. Just because I had the PC set up finally, so I thought, you know what, let's do a uh, cheeky stream. It'll probably be a couple days before I'm back to my usual routine. Just because I've got to finish setting up the PC and also I've got a um, couple of things to do at the end of this week, so... Oh uh, no, I've got to see if I remember my password, which I probably don't. Okay, there we go. Now we're logged in. Holy shit, that logged in quick. Let's see. Haha, <laughs> of course there's people on the flying circuits. Not many though. Blue's outnumbered. Chatswood, New South Wales. Jesus Christ. Um, no. Um, I kind of want to do something on Syria because that'll be the real test, but DCS is mostly dead this time of day. So, if I'm going to be able to find a server.
Yeah. Well, oh, growling side wonder it is, I guess we'll fly the Hornet. I was gonna fly the 21, but what's in your config? Uh, if you put exclamation mark specs in chat, it will tell you. All the vaccines I got, they should be doing better soon. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't have too much faith in them. Especially not the Alberta government. Why do you have over 200 ping everywhere? Because I live in Australia. <laughs> the, the, the world is quite a big place and, uh, you know, I'm on the wrong end of it, basically. All these servers are in Europe or the US or wherever, so I'm on the literal opposite side of the planet. Oh, I see Steve is in here. Growling Sidewinder still causes the game to freeze as I load in. That's uh... Even with this PC. <laughs> okay. Three Tomcats. F-14Bs as well. And an F-15. Steve's in a Hornet. Okay, you know what? I might, I might go back on that. We'll see what everyone's flying on red. 29A. What a chad. A couple flankers. Uh, S16s, of course. Yeah, we'll fly the Hornet to start with. We might switch over to something else later. Um, let's go with one of the Aussie Hornets. Actually, no, let's go with the Canadian one. Oh, but they're all hot starts, for fuck's sake. Gross. We'll just go from Katyson, but we'll change the livery to Canadian. Oh, that's hot as well, God damn it! It's a disturbing noise. I don't know why my PC just made that noise. I also feel like I'm sitting much further back in the cockpit than I usually am, but it's probably just because I'm sitting further away from the screen. Um, well, they've changed the default field of view in the Hornet, possibly. If I got a um, Be Quiet cooler, I forget what it's called, but it's a Be Quiet one. I should probably put that in the specs. I'm so used to like not having an actual dedicated cooler in my PC, I didn't think to do that. No, hang on. Why is that rebound? Oh, for God's sake. Okay, you know what? Give me a moment, guys. I need to fucking restart my game, because it's unbound everything somehow. I don't know why. <sighs> Good thing I have a backup of my bindings, or at least I should do. Just new computer things. I've got to remember where it is. It might be on another external drive. It should not have reset that. Really should not have reset that. Where are we? F-18. Oh, that's why. Oh, hang on, no. Oh, 
throttle. I don't think my throttle drivers have uh, installed properly, that's probably why. That is going to be an issue, bear with me guys. I think I've got them on here. while you take the doubles on the inners and remove the pylons on the outer. Yeah, it gives you less drag. It shouldn't be, um... Yeah, I don't know. It's doing something. I don't know what it's doing. It shouldn't be coming unplugged. Ah, oh, it wants me to restart my PC. I don't think these are the drivers, I think this is just the um, diagnostic software. Let me unplug my throttle real quick and plug it back in. Okay. If this doesn't work out, I can uh, set it up off stream later. We'll play something else. But hopefully, it works this time. How do you think the MiG 23 will do in DCS? If it's bottled well, will it be a capable fighter? I mean, it's going to have a bit more of a struggle against the modern stuff, just like everything else of that era will. Um, but against things that it actually should have faced, like early F-16s, Phantoms, things like that, it should do quite well. Especially against the Phantom, it'll do really well. If it's flown well, it'll still be able to do okay in BVR, um, especially in a Fox 1 environment. You know, it's, it's basically like a MiG-29. Um, just a bit less advanced, a bit more rough around the edges in a lot of ways, and not quite as good um, BFM-wise. But it is not by any means a bad plane. It has a, a bit of a warped reputation. Because a lot of people don't consider that the bomber and the fighter are two different things, yet they all get their uh, shoot-downs counted in together. Just like the MiG-23 MS gets counted as, you know, the same as a, a MiG-23 MLD or whatever. Why have my Hornet controls rebound themselves? Oh my god. I think everything's rebound itself. It might- oh, you know what it is, it's probably the ID on the, um... on the control setting thing. Words are hard. I think you guys know what I'm trying to say. Like it, because I'm on a new PC, it's probably changed the ID on everything, because yeah, this is reset everything. I do have backups. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna help. Hopefully my IL-2 bindings didn't shit the bed as well. Okay, well what else can we play? Not really a lot, I guess. Not, uh, not a lot that will showcase what this thing's capable of, anyway. Load them in from the controls menu. The thing is, uh, it wasn't giving me the option to load them, I don't think. Because the backups are set as, uh... Let's see what I've got them. Set as... Backups on my other drive from memory.
see, I just copy pasted all the uh, all the Lua files. That's the problem. Oh no, you know what it is? I'm a dumbass. I didn't actually copy my fucking save games folder over properly, I don't think. Let me check. I, I know I'm faffing about here, guys. Bear with me. I think I know how to fix this. So we go... So my user found on C. To save games. DCS config input. Yeah, it's given me new IDs for all of these. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to copy the old ones over and I'm going to rename them to match the new ones and hopefully that will work. I've done it completely ass backwards. <laughs> I think you're meant to save like an HTML or something, but I never actually did that. I just backed up the entire folder as it stood. Okay, DCS config. I'm gonna have to do this for every plane I own, goddammit. And for every... Okay, the keyboard's fine at least, the mouse should be fine. It's just gonna be... Yeah, it's just gonna be the, the uh, HOTAS. Hang on. They have the same IDs as the uh, the other ones, it's just... It must have hidden them away somewhere. Yeah, but I don't think it's going to load, um, unless I export them, which I didn't. We'll try it. We'll have a look in-game. Because I really do not want to have to rebind everything by hand. Really, really do not. Especially because I can't remember what some of my binds were, so I'll end up with everything completely ass backwards. See if it automatically logs me in as well. It should. It doesn't seem to want to though. Oh, there we go. Okay, controls. Yeah, see, it doesn't have load profile or save profile. Maybe if I do it by category, maybe that's why it wasn't working. Okay, I never bound that. Did find this. Aha! Oh shit, that's the wrong fucking category. I'm dumb as hell. <laughs> that's my throttle. These are my pedals. This is still gonna take a while, guys. I do apologize for the delay. I should have checked this before the stream. Annoyingly, um, when you do load this, it doesn't take you back to whichever folder you were previously in, so you have to do it, like, all over again. Okay, so that's the Skyhawk done, we're doing the Vigan now. Throttle first. 
pedals next. Okay, that's the Skyhawk and the Vigan done. Now the Harrier. She's going to take all day. <laughs> I really should have thought to check this before the stream, but it just never occurred to me that the IDs would be different and that would screw it over. But at least you can do this. That's something, I guess. Okay, Harrier pedals. I've got to make sure I'm importing the right pedals as well. That's the other thing I need to do because I've probably just done it wrong for the fucking vegan. I'll have to go back and check that. Input stick. Okay. Vegan pedals. Just to make sure. Because I don't trust myself. Crosswind. Oh no. Oh, that just screwed everything somehow. Alright, well I guess we have to do everything all over for the Vigan. Throttle first. Pedals. No, it's... That's caused all kinds of bad red things. Do it from access menu or else it doesn't load the access right, seriously? God damn it. <sighs> right. I need to quickly go back and, and recopy this because I think I just screwed it. Okay, that's from the save one. Okay, there we go. DCS, please. Okay, A4E. Access commands. Well, if I don't do it all now, I'll forget to do it later. That's the problem. Input, A4EC, joystick, throttle. Hold on, though. If you do it from the axis commands, does it load it for everything, or does it only load it for the axis commands? Because otherwise, that's going to be problems. That'll make it take five times as long. Okay, that's pedals. A4E, joystick, crosswinds. Think it does everything? Okay, well I guess we'll find out. A4EC, joystick. Okay, Vigan. They're still all screwed up, but we'll try it. You know what? I'm doing this whole thing wrong. God, I'm dumb today. What I need to do is actually load it from the correct file, not from the one that's in the folder, because it's it's loading from the one that's currently in there. It's just loading the same um, bindings in, I think. So I'll go... what's that? That's throttle. Then I go up. No, I don't want to go to that directory. So it can't leave the C directory. 
Are you serious? It cannot leave the, the fucking C drive. Bro. Because they're all on my J drive. <laughs> God damn it. So I'm going to have to recopy everything again for about the fifth time. Please end me. Yeah, that's not a bad shout. Let me do that real quick. Well, that's what I did though. Like, I moved my entire old one in. No, I don't have joystick and throttle mounts, they just sit on my desk. I moved the entire old um, save games folder over, so it should have brought everything with it, but they're obviously not working, so DCS has decided to do some fuckery. I'm just hoping that that fuckery hasn't also screwed up my backups. I think I've got them double backed up somewhere, but still, this is a big headache. I may, in fact, have to rebind everything. So that will delay the, the next uh, DCS stream if I do have to do that. It also means I'm going to have to rebind Cliffs of Dover. Because um, Cliffs of Dover, every time something comes unplugged, even if you plug it into the same port it gives a, diff a different ID and it means you have to rebind everything. That's really annoying. <laughs> Alright, there we go. Let's try this. Please, DCS. A4 axis. Old DCS. And then first up is the throttle. Okay, that imported correctly. So now pedals. I actually haven't had a chance to try the um, Skyhawk since its most recent update, so maybe I should do that. Build adapt the IL2 Great Battles files. It has a text file that sets the IZs for each device. That's why I managed to keep binds for the new motherboard. Excellent. Well, I'll probably need reminding of that the first time I attempt to play IL2, but that is good to know. Okay, uh, crosswinds. Then joystick. It would make this so much quicker if it actually, like, retained which folder you were, you know, viewing before you did the thing. Just saying. Do you have any interest in a Verpal Mongoose T50CM throttle with a desk mount? Um... Maybe... I'm not sure, actually. 
Um, the T50 throttle, from what I remember, the original one doesn't have a detent. And I kind of like having an afterburner detent. I mean, you could probably jury rig, uh, jury rig one, I guess. I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah, Yink, new computer. We're playing key binding simulator at the moment because uh, I forgot DCS needs me to rebind everything. So I'm just importing the old ones, so it'll take a little while before actually in game. Because I didn't think to do this earlier, because I have a very, very smooth brain. Okay, now we do the Vigan throttle. Oh, the Vigan bindings are still fucked. What the fuck? What the fuck? Why is everything redded out on the Vigan? If I press clear all, it only clears it for this aircraft, right? Well, we're about to find out. Oh, there we go. I can only... I can set it to check or uncheck different aircraft. Do it for the Vigan. Right, there we go. Now, keyboard, low profile. Pilot stuff about to begin here. Pilot stuff about to begin in several hours and I get this done. Um, I'm kind of debating just ending the stream and coming back on once I've done this, because this is going to take a while. I did not plan this at all. I mean, if you guys want to ask me any questions like about Gunner Heat PC or whatever, or just general questions, now would be the uh, opportune moment, I guess, since I'm not going to be flying. I won't have that to distract me. I wish there was just like an import all button. Like, that would be so much easier. <laughs> I'm sure there's some reason they haven't done it, but god, it would be so much easier. Okay, that's the Vigan done. Now we go back to the Harrier. I'm going to assume the keyboard commands have stayed the same, because the keyboard doesn't seem to have a ID tied to it. I'm probably assuming wrong, but fingers crossed. One or two planes and fly them on stream. Yeah, I know, but I don't want to forget to do it for the rest later, and I don't know what I'm going to want to fly as well. Alright, we'll do this, then I'll do uh, the MiG-21, 29, Su-27, Su-33, and maybe the Hornet. I'll do the stuff I fly frequently, once I've got the Harrier done. What am I looking for? Old DCS, Harrier, Crosswinds, then Protas. We'll do the Mirage as well, actually. Like I said, I'm not going to know what I'm going to want to fly, so I was kind of just going to do everything because, you know...
yeah, I already did uh, keyboard for the vegan since I did clear all of it. Thank you for being extremely patient with me today, guys. I know this stream has been even more scuffed than usual, but new PC things, it is what it is. I wasn't actually planning to stream until the weekend, so I've kind of jumped the gun a bit here. Uh, I should probably set up the Mi 8 as well, because I do fly that quite a bit. But see, this is the thing, I'm not going to remember now, so I may as well just go through the entire list, otherwise I'm not going to know what I have and haven't rebound. Like, that's the problem. So we'll just do fucking everything, fuck it. Takes longer, but at least then I know what I've done. I'm slowly starting to get used to this new keyboard as well. I have indeed, Rusty, um, and I've just learnt that I need to redo all my DCS blinds, so that's what we're doing at the moment. I'm just importing them, so at least it's not having to totally redo everything, but it's still painful. Um, so yeah, I got myself a, just a Logitech keyboard. It's an alright keyboard, but it's it's um, different, put it that way. So I'm used to like old school mechanical keyboards. Um, and this one's like a quiet one, where the keys are really sticky and have really stiff presses to them, which I don't like. And also, because like, I couldn't test it in the shop, right? So I didn't know what I was getting, basically, other than what it looked like. Um, and also it has like a very slight bow in the middle of it for like ergonomic touch typing. I don't touch type, so that's like actually useless to me. But I'm starting to get used to it. <laughs> used to it at least. <coughs> Excuse me. Slowly. I'm sure I'll eventually adapt to it. The problem was that my old keyboard was a... Oh, Kermit, thank you for the Prime sub. Appreciate it. Especially with uh, all the torture I'm putting you guys through at the moment. Um, so my old keyboard was like a 1990s Microsoft Multimedia keyboard. And the reason I still kept it is because I fucking loved that thing. It was really, really good. The key presses felt good. It was really robustly built. I mean, it still works and it's like nearly as old as my well it is actually older than my sister is um that thing it was a tank it was an absolute tank but the problem then became it needed ps2 this motherboard doesn't support ps2 so i thought oh, i'll just get an adapter it'll be it'll be fine ps2 to usb plugged it in no microsoft doesn't recognize it thought maybe i need to enable something or we'll find some drivers went online and found it was a common issue apparently uh, that keyboard, that specific keyboard, <coughs> is the sole Microsoft product, in fact the sole thing on Earth, that Microsoft have actually stopped supporting. Um, like, totally stopped supporting, so I had to get a new one, which makes me very, very sad. I'm gonna miss that keyboard a lot. I still have it, I just can't use it on this PC. So I've got a new one, it's going to be a pretty big adjustment because it's so totally different to my old one, but we will get there eventually. I was so totally adjusted to the old one that I couldn't type on any other keyboard without really bad typos all the time. You know, you get that way after a while. What's the performance like? Uh, in DCS, I'm not sure yet because we're still setting all the, the binds back up. But uh, in Gunner Heat PC, which is, you know, very early alpha, completely unoptimized and didn't run very well at all on the old PC, it handled it pretty well. Still not that well because not optimized, but a lot better. So I think DCS will be beautiful. Nice and smooth. I haven't changed my DCS graphics settings yet. I'm going to wait until after... Um, after I've tested it with the old settings, and then we're going to bump the settings up. That also gives me a chance to adjust things off stream to get a, a nice balance between uh, visual quality and performance, which is what I always try and aim for on the stream. Um, you know, I like my game to look as good as possible, but I also don't like it running badly. I know I have a much higher tolerance for low frame rates than most people do, but, you know, I don't want it to look like a potato. The other thing is, I can do FS2020 streams now, finally. 
um, because I couldn't run it before both because my PC couldn't really handle it and because, uh, you know, it requires Windows 10 to run. So now I'm on Windows 10, I can actually run it. And there's a whole bunch of good looking modules coming out for it soon. There's a beautiful Spitfire Mark 9 coming out um, in a couple days actually, I think on Friday. So, might be getting into that as well. Oh, no, that's the wrong button. Ah uh, yes, I like how the Combined Arms setting folder is named Ground Unit instead of Combined Arms, so it's real easy to find. Thank you, ED. That's fucking excellent. Gold star to whoever it was that decided to do that. Which games Spitfire coming out for? Uh, Microsoft Flight Sim 2020. It's from um, Flying Iron, who are the guys that are making the A7 for DCS. So I guess they've got enough people on their team that they can work on the two sims at once, which is pretty impressive. Man, I have a lot of modules. Yeah, there was um, there was a like a reveal stream done the other day. It was actually posted in my Discord. Jazz has the link to it. I'm not sure if he's still here. Still got a little things that a, a few little things that probably need some tweaking. Um, and likely we'll get it after release, but it looks pretty nice. Certainly looks like it performs pretty nice. The the big question that gets me though, this is kind of the question that hangs over MSFS in general, is the flight modeling. So. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about this, if you're in my Discord you may have, but Flight Sim 2020, while it models certain parts of a flight model very well, and obviously it's beautiful and it models the Earth very well, um, it doesn't seem to model load factor at all for some reason, like it, it just doesn't, so your stall speed doesn't increase as you bank steeply, or as you change the aircraft configuration, it, it just, it's unaffected, so you can do some real bizarre UFO shit, right? Um, I'm curious if that only affects the default aircraft, or if that also will affect third-party products, because, I mean, I know the Spitfire is a very well-behaved aircraft, and it, it doesn't, you know, it stalls gently and doesn't stall easily, but it seemed like it, it was getting way too slow before stalls were happening in that. Um, demonstration, so I'm, I'm not sure. We'll see. I'm hoping, though, that it's uh, just an issue for the default planes and, you know, third-party modules will have their own uh, simulation of load factor, because that's kind of important. You know, that's that's kind of really important, and the, the developers actually took flying lessons to be able to make a flight simulator as close as possible. I am surprised that they missed that. It could be that it just went in one ear and out the other. I guess it does that a lot with... Uh, with, you know, like, GA pilots, maybe? Like, they just think it's not important to them or something, or it's something they just forget, but it's... I mean, to me, it's kind of... It seems like an intuitive thing, you know? Because I've... I mean, you have reference speeds for, like, stall and stuff, but I've never thought of stall speed as the reference. I've always thought, like, that's a handy reference, but the angle of attack is what your actual, um, you know, your real big giveaway is. I don't know, we'll see. Hopefully it's uh, not an issue with the Spitfire or any of the other third-party stuff coming out, because there's a whole bunch of really impressive-looking things coming out. There are some uh, military aircraft in it already, but a lot of them are just kind of quick and dirty ports from previous Flight Simulator titles or from uh, X-Plane or whatever. So, some are definitely higher quality than others, to try and put it kindly. But the Spit looks pretty nice. What I'm really waiting for is uh, A2A to come across into Flight Sim 2020, because those guys are just god-tier. Absolute god-tier. 
I have their um, Spitfire for Flight Sim 10, and it's beautiful. Very detailed too, like you can do all the maintenance stuff, you can, you know, you have to refill all the fluids, all the oil, fuel, oxygen, everything after a flight, you can compression test the engine to check if you need to replace any cylinders, it's fucking fantastic. What am I up to? F-14, jeez, we're barely even down the list at all. What I might do is I'll actually, um, I don't think there's anything that you guys don't need to see in here, so I might tab out in a second and put the screen on DCS so you guys can see what I'm doing for anyone that hasn't had to do this process before. It's long and tedious, but at least then you'll know if you, you know, get a new PC or whatever, this is how you unfuck things. You don't have to rebind everything by hand, you just have to do this. This isn't much less painful than rebinding by hand, but it is what it is. Um, okay, give me a second, we will minimize that, whoop, actually no I shouldn't minimize that because I'm going to need to clear that out later, there we go. Bear with, okay, there we are. HOA crash plane they're working on making for MSFS earlier this year. Uh oh. Uh, F15, right. So we go throttle, load profile, into save games, config input, then we go F15, joystick throttle, so we're importing into the same category. We go, keep forgetting access commands, then same directory. We don't want to copy config files from Optodad, that could end very poorly. Uh, or it could end fantastically, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to find out. Give me that extra edge in controlling the uh, UFO 15. Okay, crosswind. And we've got joystick to go. So you go across the joystick, go into access commands, because apparently that helps. I don't know, this is the first time I've had to do this, so old DCS, config, input, F15, joystick, and then joystick. I think you can actually rearrange what order these things appear in, um, but I'm just going in what it's already set to. If I crashed, I mean belly land on a runway, I'm sure it's fixable. Oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Still an aircraft at any speed? Exactly, exactly, but the way that the flight model works in uh, FS2020 at the moment, or at least the way it worked when uh, when there was a very critical video made about it, um, it was, you were tied to a set stall, uh, stall speed that never changed based on anything. Not based on your angled bank, not on your aircraft configuration, I think it did change with the weather, but yeah, obviously not ideal. This is the right category because I only bound it up for the sim, so then throttle. Like I said, it's tedious, but it has to be done. And the reason I'm I am doing all of it now is like I said, I was gonna forget where I got up to. I don't want to be popping into like a tournament or something only to realize fuck I haven't bound my plane up. So we may as well do it all now. I know it's not thrilling viewing or anything, but it saves me having problems later and, and having a bit of a drama in a future stream. And it might be helpful to someone that has to do this themselves in the future.
and the rest of the categories are just for track R and mouse, and those shouldn't have changed, so we should be okay with them. Just the uh, stick and the throttle and pedals that need doing. Old DCS. I do find it odd though that it can't go above the C directory, that's very strange. Like, I don't know what the purpose of that is, it would seem like a good idea to have it able to go to any directory on the computer. Just, just a thought. So I don't have to copy paste my shit over. F86 real. Whoop, we went too far up. Save games. Do you know the version of the sim they did those previews on had a problem with flat lift being doubled? They just hotfixed that yesterday. Ah, excellent. Hey, Kang. Definitely do pretty good feeling stalls and spins. Not bad as I initially thought. Yeah, the, um, the stalls and spins on the spit did look good. They seemed like they were a bit slow. Um, like as in the, the stall speed was a bit slow. But the sp the actual spin development looked really, really good, and the recovery as well. The way she recovered herself looked just about right. Like what I'd expect from a Spitfire, both from playing other sims and from reading the way pilots talk about it. Um, joystick, throttle. Cool. Old DCS. I, I really do wish they just had an import all button. It would make this so much easier, so much quicker. I, like I said, I'm sure there's a reason they haven't, but if it's possible for them to do it and it doesn't break things, they should fucking do it. Like, really, that's something I'd like to see in a, a future patch. And by a future patch, I mean a near future patch. Just so that the next time I have to do this or the next time somebody else has to do this, they don't have to put up with this. Just hit one button, import all your old settings, Easy, you know. Uh, F18 sim. Alright, Axis. Also, by showing you guys this, I guess you can call me out if I miss anything, because I'm probably going to miss something at some point. I'm just kind of autopilot at the moment. I have to hunch forward because I pushed everything back to reach my pedals. Okay, F18, that's the throttle. This should be the crosswinds. Oh, I forgot axis, then you gotta reselect that. There's no point importing stuff for the modules I don't own. I can't do it anyway because they're greyed out um, or they don't appear in the binding list. So I'll do that next time there's a free trial or if I actually buy any of them in the future. But for now, I can't do it and there's no point trying. General... Uh, I think I even had anything bound in general. Yeah, no, don't need to do that. That's one less thing to worry about. You can see I'm doing this for mods as well. So the mods um, save their control configs to the exact same place as official modules, which is good to know. Makes it easier to find them. And I guess makes it easier for them to integrate the mod into the game as well. The nice thing is for the more recent aircraft I've got, of the mods I've recently installed, I only have the, um, the three categories. I don't have the old pedals as well. I should actually clean out my old pedal settings from this. Since I don't use them anymore, in fact, I don't have them anymore, I think they end up going to the tip, because they were broken beyond salvage, pretty much. Which is a shame, and it's a waste, but maybe Thrustmaster should build their uh, products to a higher quality, so they don't break in the first fucking place. Oop, that's not what I want to do. I want to do that. There we go. This is the Hercules still for the joystick. There we go. Um, new system, Jeeve. Brand new system. 
a little bit more powerful than my old one, just, just a little bit, teensy bit. That's for the throttle. New flat and new computer. I don't even have the J11 bound, so there's no point binding it. I don't really have the Jeff bound, but I'll just take what bindings I did have. There weren't many, because I only uh, flew it a couple times. I didn't bind any of the BBR stuff or anything. But at least if I take the bindings I've already got, that gives me a more solid platform to work from when I do actually bind the Jeff up properly, because I don't really fly it much. Could you have to suck off to get a new GPU? Uh, I was very lucky. Jazz noticed that there was a very small supply of 3070s that came in, and we both jumped on them right away. I was planning on a 3060, but I wasn't sure when it was going to appear, and I couldn't wait much longer either, because my old system was really, really starting to struggle. So I just said, fuck it, pull the trigger on the 3070. Is it JF17? Let's go. This music is entirely like too action-y for what is going on right now. <laughs> Too exciting. There is nothing exciting happening right now. This is like the absolute opposite of what this music is meant to accompany. This is for the car 50, that is my pedals. Um, my profile. Car 50. Stick. I don't even think I have the L39s properly bound up. It's a montage? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. It's a very shitty montage. Okay. Um, so this is the L39C. I'll make sure I use the right version. I think they actually, like, I think you can copy the binds across between the L39s. You can with the um, MiG-29s and the Su-27, Su-33. But, just to be on the safe side, I'll import the ones for those specific aircraft, because I don't want to fuck anything up. And I probably will fuck something up, knowing me. I have not had the best luck this week, so I don't want to push it if I can avoid doing so. I had to, um, when I was... So what I was going to do is I was going to just reinstall Steam over the top of my old install, um, old install so I wouldn't have to reinstall my games because like that I would be here for a year and then I'd lose all my mods, all my settings, everything. Um, so I, I deleted a couple of key files out of the Steam folder so that Steam would think it was broken and need to repair because that's how I did it last time. The problem was the installer hung and then when the installer finally unfucked itself, well it actually didn't, I had to restart my PC. Uh, and then it told me it needed to repair the Steam service, and that didn't end up happening properly, so, uh... Oh, I actually don't have this bound for my new pedals. Okay, well, never mind. Never fucking mind. We'll, um, we'll just... You know what? Blind the crosswinds on it now, we may as well. I just gotta push myself back a bit so I don't slam my knees into the desk. Because that would be very unpleasant. There we go. Uh, access tune. We'll put a bit of a. I need to get out of the habit of putting curves on things, to be honest, but we'll just put a bit of a curve on it. What I'm going to eventually do 
um, particularly with things like the MiG-21, is I'm going to go back in the future, not now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to um, remove the curves from the controls. Now, I might still need a desaturation because I'm, I'm not using any mounts and I don't have any extensions on this stick, so the MiG-21 in particular becomes like ridiculously twitchy and roll. Um, but I don't really want to get in the habit of using curves too much because the real aircraft doesn't have curves, right? I mean, I know it's there to help set up things for your specific um, equipment, but curves are also probably one of the reasons I can't fly formation. <laughs> you know, it doesn't help. Oh, there we go. Old DCS. Big brain. Still on the L39C. I need to fix the scroll wheel on this mouse as well. All the little serrations that you grip your finger have come off of it with age. I did actually get a new mouse with this keyboard, it's just that this one's more precise and has a bit more weight to it. So uh, I prefer to use this one. For any new DCS players who are being scared away by watching me do this right now, don't worry. You generally only have to do this once, and it's worth it. So, compared to DCS, like, the first time I set up all my blinds in DCS, I hated it. I was like, this is so tedious, why do I have to do this? It's so annoying, god, can't they just make it easier to set up? And then I had to bind up IL-2 Great Battles, and I realized this system is so much better, because in IL-2, you have binds that are shared between different aircraft for different things, you have to remember what it does in which plane you're in, you can't set specific curves, you can't set, set specific uh, controller sensitivity, nothing. Everything is done for the entire game, nothing is done per aircraft, and a lot of stuff gets reused. So, believe me guys, DCS has probably the best binding system for controls of any flight simulator on Earth. Like, it's just amazing by comparison, and you really miss it when you play something, like, you really realise just how spoilt we are by DCS when you play something else and have to bind it up. Might not seem that way, but believe me it is. Hey, we're up to the Mirage. Oh yeah, I need to do that because last, well, it shouldn't be as much of an issue on this PC, but my old one, if I bound more than two aircraft and hit OK, my entire PC would lock up. Okay, what am I doing? Mirage 2000. Once I've done the Mirage, I'll hit OK on it. So, throttle first. Then crosswinds. Joystick. Okay, there we go. So that's saved. MB three thirty nine. We're getting there very, very slowly. Again, uh, mods store all their configuration files in the same place, which is convenient. It means I don't have to hunt around for them while doing this. Crosswinds. I forgot I actually got the Mi 8 after I got the crosswinds, which is probably a good thing because I can't imagine flying it with my old pedals. That would have been an exercise in frustration. I would have been able to turn sharper to one side than the other because the fucking things never worked properly. This is your uh, your bi-weekly don't buy things off Thrustmaster advertisement, by the way. 
not until they fix their shit, which is a shame because like they've got good the controls are well set out, but god they're so badly designed. I wish they built them better. I, I really, really wish they built them better. Um, I don't think I ever bound up the track IR gunner stuff, so we can ignore that. MiG-15, let's go. The annoying thing is, too, a lot of the, like, failure points in Thrustmaster products are just, you can tell it was because they cheaped out on the design. It wasn't, oopsies, uh, it wasn't a thing that had to happen. Like, it's it's not any fault of the the um, materials, it's just that they cheaped out. They used the wrong materials in the wrong place, or they didn't make something thick enough, or they didn't use enough screws, or something like that. Like, for every fucking Thrustmaster product I've owned that's broken on me, which is all of them, um, that is the issue. They're so close, and yet so far away. Whoop. Make 19. F? Oh, the stream dropped. My bad. It still does that, apparently. Um, even though my internet here is marginally faster than the old connection. Same speed, it's just uh, it gets the speed better because it's through fibre to the premises. You see the new EU law that makes electronic manufacturers have their products designed to be actually repairable by their owners and make... I'm glad at least the EU has some fucking sense. They might be stupid about other things, but at least they have some brains there. Right to repair should be a thing everywhere. Like, anyone who argues against right to repair can go jump in the sea. There is no legitimate argument against it. And that is that is not my opinion, that is a fucking fact. If you disagree with that fact, feel free to jump in the sea. Been flying around Medivac in X-Plane 11. Cowan Sim Bell 222 is pretty good. I've been tempted to pick up X-Plane still because there's a bunch of really cool old uh, vintage airliners in that that aren't in any other sim yet. But we'll see. Maybe in the future. I don't want to pick it up just yet because I've just spent a shitload of money, right? So. William, thank you for the follow. Uh, we will actually play some DCS soon. I've just got to set up my controls first for the new PC. That's what we're doing here. This is, this is like a... Um, Kind of a, a combination of how to do this and also you guys get to suffer with me as I do this. So welcome. Uh, we are MiG-19. Yep, there it is. Joystick. Throttle. I really hope I haven't crossbound anything. That would be bad. But like I said, I'm in autopilot here. I'm not really paying attention to what I'm doing. I'm just pressing buttons and hoping for the best. Which, to be fair, is how I usually operate. Good way to is to find some essential ones and progress as you learn the aircraft. Yeah, so that's what I did. Um, obviously now I'm doing everything that I've already had bound because I'm importing my old settings. But when I first started learning aircraft, I wouldn't bind anything I didn't fly yet. So that's why the J11 isn't bound, because I've never flown it. I fly the Su-27 instead. Um, things like that. So there's a bunch of different aircraft in DCS that I have never flown, and they're not bound. But everything I have flown, I have bound at some point. Some of them need rebinding. My MiG-21 needs rebinding because the control scheme I set up for it was really, like, ass backwards because it was the first thing I ever played in DCS. Um, but I can't be bothered to do that yet, so that's a long-term project. And I fly the thing so much that even though the controls aren't laid out very logically for me, um, it just, by force of repetition, it's embedded in my brain. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What the fuck is going on here? We'll take the more recent one. But, uh... Hmm... Uh... 
I, I, I don't know what's happening here. one so we'll use that uh, make 23 mod I don't even remember if I oh I would still have it installed because it's on this list <sighs> we'll rebind that I don't really fly it that often because it's uh, very 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 rough and unfinished but and soon enough we'll have a real make 23 and a fighter variant of that but oh wrong folder but uh, until then it's it's handy to have now and then for just mucking around because it has such a good acceleration and such good speed you can uh, use it to do some adventuring into the upper reaches of the atmosphere okay throttle crosswind and then joystick Oh, no, I've done it again. So the MiG-29 and 29S, you can actually directly copy the controls between them. That would actually probably be faster. Um, I'm tempted to do it, but I might not. I might just do it through this. That way it reduces the chance of something going wrong, at least in theory. New PC? Yep. I only just got Steam up and running today. This is the first time I've run DCS and I realized I've got to rebind stuff. So I'm just importing my old binds at the moment. So it's a very slow and painful process, but it's one that needs to be done. I keep fucking doing that. Um, old DCS. What am I doing? There we go. Input. MiG-29. A. Joystick. RFG crosswind. Axis. Joystick. Load profile. Back to the same folder. If it just stayed in that folder, this would have been over, like, half an hour ago, at least. There we go. But you know what, no, we'll just copy the MiG-29 stuff over, because that's much quicker. So, I'm tabbing out right now. Go into DCS. Uh, can I not open that in your window? the fuck? Windows 10, what the fuck? Why can I not open that in a new window through context menus? Every day I miss Windows 7 more and more. Okay. So when we change the uh, joystick command, so we'll just paste that in there, replace those files. Paste it in there, replace those files, and that should be all the MiG-29s bound, in theory. We can do the same thing. Oh no, we can't actually because the 33 has some extra binds. So we'll go back up to that folder. I know you're probably asleep by now, Monk, but uh, thanks for stopping by. Catch you later. And thanks for the uh, help with this, by the way. <laughs> probably would never have figured it out by myself. Go say those couple cents for the profit margins. I know, right? After 10 years, keep the product line the same. Yeah, they, they don't make improvements on anything. It's kind of like, I mean, to be fair, Natural Point at least came in the channel and like 
asked me what I thought of the tracker, I'm like, this thing's really weak and breaks all the time, and they're like, well, we might change the material on it. But, but it's like, the design of this hasn't changed for so long, and it's the same as the Thrustmaster peripherals. They don't change a design even when it's been long enough that you have so much data to know where the failure points are and how you can improve the product. They're just like, oh, fuck it. Who cares? <laughs> Oh, that's easy. I don't want to bind that. I want to bind Sim. A lot of these I'm going to have to rebind anyway once I get the left throttle uh, working again, especially the Warbirds, because on my Spit, that is my uh, my revs. Seriously, the Spit 9 and Spit 9 Clipped Wing have different fucking inputs. I'll just copy-paste them as well, I guess. Oh, I guess they would have to, because some people would want to have different curves for the clipped wing. <laughs> I got the fidgets today. start washing my volume in a couple of hours. Um, I mean, I probably should now. It's nearly 9 p.m., but I don't want to piss my neighbors off. I, I know I've got a loud voice and it carries very well, too well, so I don't want people uh, being kept awake on my account. Not on a weekday. If it's, uh, actually, no. No, it's tomorrow that's student night at the pub. Tomorrow I can probably make as much noise as I fucking want because everyone else does, but... Not today. Okay, Spitfire, joystick. That's interesting, it doesn't show it as separate for the clipped wing in here, even though it, I guess it just duplicates it, maybe? I will go check that real fast, because that's odd. It's very odd. Config, input. Spit 9, or just copy this whole folder. Someone had the need for speed, hey, core check. Yeah, uh, I had the need for speed right up until the point I realized I had to rebind everything. It's not the keyboard, like, the, the keyboard um, bind save, same as the track R and the mouse, it's the IDs for the um, HOTAS that requires you to rebind the HOTAS. Even if you've got your old settings, it like, the IDs aren't the same, so the files won't play nice, so you've got to rebind everything. It's very tedious. So I'm only, except for the Vigan where I had to clear everything because it glitched out, um, I only have to copy over the Hotas stuff, I don't have to worry about keyboard or mouse or any of that. Which saves me some time at least, not a lot, but some. I know I'm falling behind on chat a bit, but uh, I'm trying not to lose track of where I'm up to in this. Because if I do lose track of where I'm up to in this, uh, it could result in some interesting problems when I go in-game. Okay, it's 225. There you are. Joystick. And there. We'll save after the Su-25T and then we'll continue on. That's the throttle first, then the pedals. Make sure I get the right pedals, not my old ones. So if you ever install DCS on a new machine, or, you know, copy your files over, this is what you've got to look forwards to. 
Okay, we're gonna hit OK to save what we've got, so that if the game crashes now or the PC dies or something, um, it's at least saved and I can come back to it later. No, I was going into the wrong folder there. Remember when ED screwed all our keybinds like a year ago for no reason? That may have been why the MiG-21 had two sets. I don't remember that specifically, but that would explain why there'd be two sets of binds for the MiG-21 and nothing else. Um, okay, cross wings. If you guys see me miss something or double up on something, please do let me know. I'm, like, my brain vacated the premises, like, an hour ago. More than an hour ago, if I'm honest. <laughs> Sometime while I was playing Gonna Hate PC, I think. We're going to C27. Nearly done, at least. Nearly done. I bound up the TF-51, but I may as well use what's in here. It probably won't have bindings for my new pedals, because I don't think I've flown it for a very long time. Oh, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh my god, it does actually have them for my new pedals. That's interesting. I don't actually remember when I flew the last, but apparently it wasn't that long ago. for the crosswinds and joystick use the same curves for everything um Usually, so most of the time I'll put a 15% curve on pitch and you uh, sorry, pitch and roll. Um, and then I usually put about a 20 to 25 on your actually, a lot of stuff I took the curves off totally with the new pedals, but then I realized that was a mistake with certain modules, so I started putting it back on. Um, and then I have curves set for the afterburner detent on my throttle. Thank you, Zwipe, for the six month resub. Appreciate it, man. Hat clip. Hat clip struggles with um, glasses, and I also have a lot of glare coming from the window behind me, and I also don't really like wearing a hat, let alone indoors, so for some people it's definitely the better option for me. Not really. Um, I've always used this. It's, you know, not very robust, it's quite fragile, and it's easy for me to break it by dropping my headset or, you know, trying to get up and walk out of my chair with it still on, but um, I find it's more reliable than the hat clip. I still have the hat clip, so if this breaks I've got a backup, but I prefer to use this. Did Dylan get solid stainless steel clip and say goodbye to all these problems with shitty plastic clips? Yeah, next time this breaks, I probably will. Aren't they treated as different planes in DCS because of the different flight models for the clip wing spit? Um, yeah, but also... See, they, they have a unified binding in this, but then they have two separate binding folders in the actual config files, so I'm not sure what that's about. It's kind of odd. I'm sure there's a reason. Maybe they set it up like that for um, people that want to do tweaks in Notepad or whatever, but in-game at least you can only bind them both onto the same menu. 
Uh? Excuse me? What happened to my pedal binds for the Huey? Huh? That's really odd. That's really, really odd. Okay, well, throttle. I guess we'll have to rebind that now. Oh, no, shit, don't do that, Jesus. Uh, clear that. So then, where are we? Pedals, 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 pedals. This scroll wheel is really starting to get on my nerves. Bro, please. I can scroll down, but I can't scroll up. Um... There we go. I was looking in the wrong place. Okay, there we go. Um, and we'll put a curve on that like I usually do. We'll make it... Make it 15, I think. Actually, I'll do that for... Um, what was the other thing I set the pedals on as well? It was the L39C, wasn't it? I don't want that to be too strong of a thing, so we'll go back here, and we'll turn that down to a... ...15, because these pedals are much more sensitive and much more precise than the old ones were. Okay, so the Huey's done. Uh, those don't need binding. Yak 52 is the only thing left, in theory. Unless I've got a mod hidden somewhere below that. No, there we go. Yak 52. Yeah, access commands, that load profile. Oh, no. Scroll past it. Okay, there we go, that should be everything, finally. Question though, why do you have it so far from your head? Uh, you have mine basically sitting on my ear cup. Because my camera, my webcam sits slightly at like half an inch to my right and my actual track IR camera is offset about probably three, four inches to my left. Um, I just found that tended to work better. I found if I had it too close to my head, it would get easily bamboozled by, especially um, the older one with the weaker LEDs, would get bamboozled by reflections off my glasses. Um, I found that my head angles weren't as good, so I look around like a lot. Mine's set so that um, I have to really move my head to look somewhere. Just I just find that more comfortable and more intuitive. And I found that if I didn't set it this far away from my head, I would have a lot of trouble with the LEDs crossing over each other or blanking on my, um, like the side of my head or my glasses or whatever. So I find by having them pushed that far away from me, there's nothing that can interfere with them except ambient light coming in from behind. Or my hair if I let it get too long. Sad story if it was also meant to enable disabled people to interact with computers better. Well, I mean... At least it kind of led to a whole bunch of different products that can help do that. So it, it wasn't a dead end. That's something, I guess. Tip for dealing with a loud voice, used to do radio. Either increase the volume on your headphones for sounds coming from your mic. You'll hear yourself yelling or... I don't have, um... I don't have a... 
what's the word? I don't have a monitor on this, because if I hear myself speaking, I'll jam myself. Like, if I hear speech, it fucks me up really badly. Um, so I only use that when I'm trying to set the audio levels, and even then it doesn't work very well. The, the problem is, partly because my hearing's kind of ropey to begin with, and partly just because it's a thing that runs in my family. Um, it might be a puzzle piece thing, because both my sister and I are the same. We don't know what volume we're speaking at. I can't tell the difference between when I'm whispering and when I'm yelling. I have no idea. Like, my internal volume control is just non-existent. And especially if I'm listening to music or I'm in game and there's audio, I can't hear myself over it, so I raise my voice. Um, yeah, it's... It's a bit of a problem. Um... I have tried the, the route of increasing the gain on my mic, but that doesn't help because then I'm yelling and my mic's picking up all of it on the extra gain and it's blowing out everyone's eardrums on the stream as well, so I just got to try and train myself to not yell. Look, I'm... I still haven't replaced my second monitor yet. I'm back to the old-fashioned way of reading on my phone. You guys remember how long it took me to catch up on chat on my phone? We're back to that, alright? Get off my back. <laughs> Is a presets introduction debacle? Aha. Hey, escape taxi. New PC smells like a new car in that land from afar. <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of, like, I was really noticing the smell from this one. I was like, oh shit, not again, but it's gone now. I'm still on 1080, but the stream quality is probably a little better. Also, because nothing's moving on the screen, the bitrate's going to be really high, right? Okay, there we go. I've caught up. It has been 87 years and I've caught up on chat. So you're saying if I change your audio by like 4 decibels I could fuck your entire life over for the next 20 minutes? Uh... I mean... More like if you changed my audio by 4 decibels you could fuck over your hearing for the next 10 years. Like, it, it doesn't bother me. I can't tell how loud I am anyway, it makes no difference to me. It'll affect you guys. <laughs> Use Twitch to DCS? I have it. I don't really use it because I don't like having things on screen. Um, because then I can't see aircraft behind them. And I also don't want to have two chat feeds because um, Twitch to DCS doesn't display emotes or things like that. Um, it's, it's a handy tool to have, especially if you have VR, but for me I prefer to have the actual full chat log on another screen. Now at the moment I'm short of another screen because my old second monitor blew up. Um, I've got to replace it, so I'll probably buy that next week or something. Just grab myself a nice cheap monitor. Uh, and then I'll have two monitors again, and I won't have to spend ages catching up on the phone. Hell yeah, Thermo. Sleep well, man, and we absolutely need to fly soon. We'll take the Mirages out for a spin. It's been a while since I've done some proper Mirage uh, triangle gang stuff. Slam dunking on nerds with the R530. Alright. Let's see if that worked. I'm going to be really pissed if I fucked any of that up. Ah, now we can join Red. The word is miraging. Now we'll take him to Mirage World. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, on Low Blow's stream Mirage World. It's one of my favorite DCS memes. It's, it's amazing. The artwork for Mirage World is even better. If new PC, why not 60 FPS on stream? I forgot to set it to 60 FPS. Good observation. Uh, I will have to remember to do that for next stream. I also haven't got into my BIOS and, um, you know, fixed up the clock speed on my RAM yet, so my RAM's running a little slower than it should be. But compared to my old PC, it, it like it's a huge difference already. So it's all stuff I can do later. but I've got a lot of tweaking to do with this setup. I need to lift my desk up a little so I can sit close to it without destroying my kneecaps. 
I need to uh, raise my monitor a bit. So I need to get an actual monitor stand because it's sitting even lower than it used to, which is not very comfortable. And then uh, fit the second monitor on there. Then get myself a nice little table next to the desk. So I stop accidentally pushing things off of it with the throttle. Send you a few vacuum tubes so you can repair your second monitor. It's already gone, unfortunately. It went to the tip. Even with 32 gigabytes and NVMe SSD DCS taking its time to load? Yeah, I don't know why. I do not know why. It may be that uh, it has decided to crash itself because DCS is going to do DCS things no matter what system it's running on. The other thing I might do um, is I might kick up the bitrate back to the Twitch maximum, which I think is 6,000. I could probably push it above 6,000, but I don't think you guys have noticed a difference on Twitch. And we'll see how that goes, because I'm not sure connection, like my upload speed, or if it was my PC, it may have been my PC. Either way, um, probably within a month or two, I'm going to double my internet speed, I think, because I'm probably going to save a lot of money on my power bill here compared to the old place. So uh, that might be a thing to do. Let's take the 29S out. Not from Tbilisi, though. Why do people need this many hot starts? Oh, can we not take one from Nalchik anymore? Oh yeah, fuck me, I guess. He's he's turned it from a uh, like a three front war to a, a fucking one front war. That might actually be an improvement. This mission may actually like be worth playing now. We'll see. I doubt it, but we'll see. Uh, it wasn't first load though, it's second load, because I actually looked Oh shit, all my binds are fucked. <laughs> what? I think that's just MiG-29 things. Yeah, that's just MiG-29 things. The stick spawned all the way over for some reason. The other problem is, because I've had to push back away from my desk to avoid sledging my knees, uh, my track IR is a lot further away than I'm used to, so the game's all fucked up. <laughs> Let's take... I'm not playing with POM, so I'll just roll with the, the Damgarten one, I think. If I'm flying with POM, I use the Turkmen skin, but I'll go with Damgarten. Had a little bit of a stutter there. My mouse froze. We'll go all 77s. Yeah. Exact same graphic settings I used to run with, I haven't changed anything yet. We'll do a couple flights like this, and then I'll hop out, I'll do some tweaking, and we'll uh, do some more stuff. Access coordinator for the... Claiming cliff stuff, it appears on the right side of the screen, so it's going to be behind my big stupid face. What's the... it's control page up for the frame rate, isn't it? No, it's not. Control page down. No, it's not. Right control pause. Do I even have a pause key? Oh, it's probably a function key or something. Yeah, but on my keyboard there's um, channel keys there because it's a wireless one. So I'm going to have to hit control. Function. Oh my god, this is going to be a three-handed job. Control. Function. I don't know. 
No, I have no clue. I'm gonna have to rebind it. I've got to get the engines in this started up anyway, so... Eh. I said I have to get the engine started up. Wakey wakey left engine. Wakey wakey left engine. Is my left engine the one that's running? It shouldn't be. I don't think... I don't think it saved the binding correctly, hang on. No, it did. Oh, you know what it probably is? Hang on. That's what it is. Why did it bind that? <sighs> okay, that's bound correctly at least. How about the Su-27? Just gotta make sure. Yeah, okay, we're good. That's why. Except now, my throttle binding on the left engine is... Well, my throttle on the left engine, sorry, is, uh... Fucked up. What is... The actual key binding... For the left engine? So I can set it back to nothing. Throttle left down, right alt and num minus. No, I know what the start is. It's the problem is the throttle's out of whack. Even though it's in detent on the screen, it's like fucked. I might need a new aircraft. That is exceptionally. something I was going to do. Oh, right. Should the stick move with trim changes on the ground? Yeah. The, the, the way the trimmer works is it forces the stick forwards and back, basically. Doesn't matter if it's on the ground or in the air, as far as I know. Um... Right control pause. I'm pretty sure I don't have a pause button on here. Not one that's easily accessible. I'll try right control insert. I don't think that's bound on anything. And it doesn't work. Bro. I give up. No, Jazz, because a bunch of different aircraft use home as a binding. Like, I can't start the MiG-15 without the home button. So I don't have enough axes to do it. Either way, I think we've established the frame rate's pretty good, at least on the ground. Like, this is silky smooth. So what we're gonna do is, after this flight, we'll quickly exit out of the server, 
um, and crank the settings, not maybe all the way, but pretty far off. I swear to fucking god. My engines are not fucking starting, either of them. What is up with this plane? Insert home page up, delete and page down, yeah. I can't start my engines. The bind's working. It shows the bind working, I just can't start my engines. Is this some fun new bug or do I have something double bound without realizing? GS Classic Taxiway Takeoff. The throttle's all the way back. Power on. We'll set that and we'll turn the radio comms off. I don't know, it might be something to do with why the stick's spawning out of position. GS may have fucked something up on the aircraft spawn. I don't know. That shouldn't be doing that, though. Didn't look like you found the 29S throttle the same. Oh, wrong button. You are correct. I'm a dumbass. I deleted the wrong one. Oh, you know what? Now I've got to fucking find my... Shit. Okay, hang on. I know how to fix this. It's not that. Good catch, thank you. I'm glad one of us is awake. Except that doesn't even... Okay. Let me go back to the MiG-29A, because I know that's set up correctly. Axis tune. 036. Okay, let me just put this in chat so I don't forget it. 0-3-6-11-23. I got them big brain powers today, guys. 35. 49. 62. These aren't good lottery numbers, by the way. Enter at your own peril. Oh, thank you. Okay, there we go. Right. So let's go MiG 29S. I don't know why it didn't copy that over correctly, but whatever. So thrust for both. They on here. I'm glad you can actually type the numbers in here now, finally. Shouldn't it be a slider? It probably should, but I mean, this works. I don't know why it works or how it works, but it does work in this way. Oh, not 777. 9100. Pedals bound to thrust, they shouldn't be. Oh, yeah, there, but there's no Z-axis on them anyway. Okay, and then big 29G. Uh, oh, you know what it is? It probably, um, probably didn't overwrite the bindings properly for these. So that's something I should check, actually. 
I might need to just redo these in total. Hmm, that's what happened. Okay, so we're just going to import our old settings. That's what's happened here. Sorry guys, I know I'm fucking farting around with this a lot. So you can't just copy paste them anymore. You used to be able to. So this is MiG-29S. Uh, joystick. Throttle. The war will be over by the time we're in the ad. Okay, joystick crosswind. So when I originally bound all the different MiG-29s up, you used to actually, like, literally be able to copy the MiG-29A config across to the other two and it didn't cause any problems, but apparently now it does. So, oh well. It was worth a try. So we'll fly one sortie, we'll go out and kick the settings up and then we'll come back and fly another. I can't wait to fly on cold war with this. Take the 21 out, settings cranked on Syria. Like, honestly guys, I my flying's gonna be sloppy because I haven't played DCS for a couple weeks now, but other than a few brief single player flights to the MiG-21 the other day, so I was trying to teach my sister to fly it. Um, but the difference in performance, the lack of freezing and stuttering and the, the good frame rate, I think is going to make a huge positive impact on my flying. Because I was held back so much before by DCS's performance, and that's not going to be a problem anymore. There will be other problems, mostly me being dumb, but uh, DCS misbehaving shouldn't be one of them. Oh no, this is why my internet still drops out, so you can still use that, believe me. Or when someone else is rubber banding around, it still has plenty of use. 3080 max out drops 30 FPS at cities in Syria. Good luck with that. Well, I won't turn it all the way up. I'll turn it most all the way up. Not all the way. Flying skills are better now than mine at its best. I couldn't say that. You see a little practice. I didn't get to where I am now by not flying, put it that way. Practice a lot, and you'll get there. I mean, like, I'm definitely not what I would call I mean, some people maybe say I'm good at the game. I wouldn't say I'm good at the game. I'd say I'm okay at the game. I'd say I'm better than average, but I wouldn't say good. Like, for me, better than average and good are two different things. Um, but I didn't get to where I am by, you know, just jumping on and suddenly I knew how to do everything. The reason I can do things with the MiG-21 that nobody else can, or that very few other people can, um, is because I have a lot of hours in it. I crashed a lot of times, I got shot down a lot of times to make that happen. Every death in the sim is a learning experience, unlike real life where you die once and you don't learn anything from it because you're dead. And you can't learn when you're dead. Well, I would hope not. Thank you. 
red hard no I like I prefer the green one you shouldn't actually be able to change the hard colors I think I think the night mode goes to either yellow or red in, in uh, the real aircraft like the car 50 does the same thing but you shouldn't be able to just change color like that's not a thing night mode is yellow yeah I know in the car 50 it's yellow I want the MiG-31 hard. It's got yellow, it's got uh, yellow, red, like white, I think. Beautiful. It looks kind of like the Mirage F1 HUD, where it's uh, it's not really a HUD as such, like it's not projecting from a CRT, it's actually projecting from dials onto the combiner glass. It looks so cool. It has a CRT element too, but most of it's just projected from... Uh, from like dials, rotating dials. God, this is so smooth. It is so freaking smooth. IL-2 with this is gonna be absolute butter. The um, Mirage F1's coming out soon, small boy. Uh, I don't know when, but Aviodev, or whatever they call themselves now, are showing screenshots of it every now and then on their Facebook, and at least visually speaking, it looks like it's just about done. And, uh, I won't repeat the phrase because I'll probably get banned for it, but if you look closely on the Mirage F1's gun sight, not the, the updated modern one with the HUD, but the I actual original gun sight, it has a special mode that you can engage when you play on Hogger. Or on Growling Side I'll let you find out what that is for yourself. Oh, that nose. She wants to fly. my speed break out. That's uh, interesting. I must have got to reset it. Team kill mode? What? No. I got the radar on. I'm in track while scan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did they not load a belly tank? They did not load a belly tank. Thank you, Ground Crew. Real cool. We're nearly out of fuel already. And my flying is super wobbly at the moment. I'm gonna have to fix this scroll wheel on my mouse, it's pretty busted, unfortunately. I wasn't listening to that AWACS call out at all. You know what? We're gonna RTB. Hey, Gunner! Cheers to the raid, man. Hope you had a good stream. We're uh, having a bit of a comedy of errors here. Uh, of course. That'll be that space kid out up there, probably. I'm 
my ground crew decided not to give me a belly tank, so we're RTV already. <laughs> oh, that frame rate's so nice. Silky smooth. So, we'll land this, uh, we'll quickly exit out, crank the settings up a bit. You know, not too crazy, just more suitable for my new specs. And then I'll hop back in and fly out again. can't get the counter to work, it just, it doesn't want to, what was I set it to, like control insert or something, not working. It's under general, right, or is it UI layer? No, it's general. Why is my scroll wheel dying on me, please? That's already bound something. Uh, right, alt delete? There we go. It's still not working, what the fuck? Yeah, I think it... I'm trying to remember what it was on my old keyboard, I don't remember. But it, it, it's not gonna work, so fuck it. Just use a Steam one. Uh, I don't even have that enabled. I don't like having shit on my screen, right? So I don't usually use frame counters unless I'm actually testing something. I don't really care if the frame rate's like... I don't care what the number is, I just care that it looks smooth, honestly. That's the important thing to me, is that it actually looks smooth. I ain't here to fucking compare big sizes, I'm here to actually have fun playing the game, so... As long as it runs well, I'm happy. We're a bit heavy for landing here, but whatever. What just came unplugged? That was concerning. Um... No, I'd say they're probably more than 70. It's, it's like butter smooth. Absolutely butter smooth. I'd say it must be up in, like, probably 80s, 90s. Maybe even a little more. It's so silky. And I am so bad at landing the MiG-29. Come on. He says, as he butters it down. What is the dick size? You gotta subscribe to my G-Suit only fans if you wanna find out that. Just, just saying. Oh, it's so smooth though. Like, even the track IR movement. So my track IR movement used to, like, stutter a lot. Which is part of the reason I had trouble spotting people. It's so smooth. I do actually have the G-Suit here. I should chuck it on one day and just, like, go get my mail in it or something. If the neighbors don't think I'm fucking mental already, they will after that. Alright, we'll just stop it here, hop out, crank the settings up, uh, leave server. And then come back in.
So I'll have to remember after the stream, uh, ramp up my clock speed on the RAM, because I forgot to do that yesterday, and also kick it back up to 80, oh sorry, 60 frames a second on Twitch. Um, I might bump the bit rate up a bit as well, we'll see. Oh fuck, there's actually people in Cold War. Not many though. Hmm. Um, system. Textures high, terrain high, see if traffic high, water high, visibility range extreme, heat blur high, shadows high, res can stay at 1080. Yeah, we'll turn this up to 1024, it doesn't need to be 1024 every frame. Turn that up to four times, I might kick it back down to two if it has too much of an impact. Depth of field is, I don't know why people would want that unless they're making uh, cinematics. It's distracting, dirt and flare, motion blur makes me fucking sick, we'll leave that off. Um, SSLR is notorious for eating frame rate, so we'll leave that off, we'll turn that up, we'll turn that up. Preload radius, that's all the way up, we'll turn that up, not that it actually does anything. Gamma, AF can go back up to 16, that can go, oop, no, default, it's on, yep, 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 V-Sync, do I want that on? I get him. Um, I don't know. I guess. No? Not maxing out on Gamma? No. Gamma's for fucking scrubs. Anyone who doesn't want to fight at night time without turning their Gamma up shouldn't fucking venture outside of fucking Hoggett. Shit, I say that. Most Hoggett players are probably less afraid of flying at night. Might get screen tearing, but you'll have less input latency if the system puts up above 60 frames. Gotcha. I think my monitor supports FreeSync, but I have no idea what FreeSync is or how the fuck it works, because, like, I'm, I'm too old for this shit, man. It was really, like, telling on the Cold War night missions where I couldn't see anyone but people could see me really easy. It's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, so it's probably like me and two other guys that haven't turned their gamma all the way up. That's good to know. Gamer mind wins again. I used to have my gamma turned up a little more. Um, but once I got this monitor, I found I could turn it down without losing any, like, visual quality. I had to have it turned up before because of my old screen. I did try 1.8, but then the shadows seemed a bit too strong. Never had the chance to do a multiplayer, but in single player I tried landing at the flanker at night. During my time with a keyboard and mouse only, I never tried even since then with a Hotas. Shit, if you tried a night landing with a keyboard and mouse, that's uh, that's impressive. Okay, that's Mustang Shader mod tripping that. I'll have to reinstall. Re I'll have to restart the game. DCS can be a little picky. If it takes too long to load, it'll fail the integrity check on that shader. Um, I don't know why, but it's fixed with a simple restart. Fucking DayZ back in the day, especially the mod version of DayZ, used to be terrible for that. People would just turn their gamma up. Like, it was ridiculous. And it was so annoying because nighttime was the best time to actually go out hunting for players in DayZ, like by far. Like a, a half moon or a full moon night was perfect for it. Until you ran in somebody with their, gang, uh, their gamma cranked up to like a fucking hundred. GS. Yeah, Cold War's not really got enough people on it at the moment. So for those who have joined within the last probably hour or so, um, the usual time streams, which is early morning for me, probably won't be happening until the weekend. Um, partly because I don't want to cause too much noise. Um, 
they'll also probably move a bit later so instead of like being three or four in the morning my time it'll be more like you know five or six when most people are waking up anyway um and the other thing as well is i've got stuff to do over the next couple of mornings i've got appointments and shit to go to um so probably the weekend's the start for regular streams again at the regular time i still got to get ace combat seven in uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm con uh, contractually obliged to complete that, so we'll try and get that out of the way at some point. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other games that I either haven't played for a long time because my PC couldn't handle them, like Space Engineers, which is uh, used to be one of my favourite games, I loved it. Um, and then I need to play Workers and Resources, I've got a couple other things I want to try. So, there'll be a bit more variety going forwards, um, more flight sims as well, because I never used to really be able to reliably stream FSX on this PC, or sorry, on the old PC. I couldn't really handle it. This one should handle it with no issues, and we can stream 2020 on here as well. So there'll be more variety than there used to be because I'm not limited by hardware anymore. It's magical. Color in EFT is so fucking bad. I, I can agree with that. Tarkov has this thing where I don't know why. It's it's got like really heavy shadowing and really heavy fog, and it looks really bizarre. I don't know how you technically call that effect. I don't know why they've done it, but it looks like ass. Like I don't know if it's meant to be photorealistic or something. It looks like shit, and it makes it really difficult to fucking see. I suspect the reason they did it was to try and make it so you could actually hide in shadows, and gamma cranking wouldn't do anything to to um, bring out the outline of people. But it looks dumb. Spitfire in a couple days, seal. And there'll be more coming after that, I think. Washed out all the colour, that was the worst. Yeah, the colour, uh, like, the, the colour grading in Tarkov is really bad. Um, especially if it's an overcast map, like, if the weather's overcast, it's just grey. Like, nine times out of ten, game developers or, or people that make maps for games or whatever, fuck, even a lot of uh, cinematographers should not be allowed access to colour grading tools because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Like that, that kind of meme that happened with films a couple of years ago where everything was cyan or orange. It was on like a cyan orange color grade. The Aviators are really obnoxious example of it, which is a shame because I like that film, but everything, like the colors were just so fucked up. And then it turned to brown. Everything's gray or brown because my desert warfare, Call of Duty, like ushered in this whole age of brown games. And uh, now you have Tarkov, which turns everything like kind of greenish gray. FreeSync is a technique which synchronizes a fresh rate of the monitor with the GPU frame rate output so you don't get tearing as it's synchronized, you get the less latency because the monitor is blah 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 blah. Mostly matters for high refresh monitors. Yeah, in my case it wouldn't help. Okay, that's fair. I have been kind of toying with getting a slightly larger, I mean like 27 inch at most probably. And then using this as a secondary, but at the same time I don't need a really wide secondary. I could just probably use like a 4 to 3 ratio like my old one was, and it wouldn't be a problem. But that's all stuff I can work out later. Oh no, not a 29A. I'm not feeling that brave today. Not. Oh my god, it's still really smooth. And I'll actually be able to see shit on the ground now. I need to make some actual load to like preset loadouts for this. Yeah, you know why? It's because that loadout doesn't come with one by default. That's why. That's why. That's why I didn't have a fuel tank last time. It wasn't the ground crew's fault, it was my own dumb fault. I'm sorry for bad mouth. Yeah, yeah, 
See, I'm noticing a little bit lower frame. A little more than it was. Oh, there's a big stutter. I don't know what that was about. I can always turn the settings back down a little if this is too much. My mic is cutting out sometimes. It shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. Goes out for two seconds at a time. Oh, I might be peeking it out. Maybe. I'm not sure, that's very important. It could also be because the drivers aren't set up for it properly. I think I've still got to get the most up to date ones for it. I might turn the anti-aliasing back down to two times. There's not really much noticeable difference between two and four, to be honest. A little bit, maybe, but not much. We'll start taxiing now. I wish they'd fix the uh, cockpit lighting in this. Well, a lot of the ED modules need fixing. Because now after they changed the global illumination last year, the instrument lighting is invisible during the daytime. It is on a lot of modules, but it's really noticeable on the ED modules. Excited for the 912? I sure am. Absolutely. I think, um, th this is my hot take. I think when the 912 comes out, a lot of people that really like the FC3 MiG-29 are going to discover they absolutely hate the MiG-29's actual ergonomics on the real thing. Because uh, FC3 gets away with a lot of sins, but the actual MiG-20, I mean, the, the ergonomics aren't awful, but they're definitely not good. The 23 is going to be even worse, like, in that respect. I love the MiG-23, it's my favourite jet, so I will have no issues with it. But, um, a lot of people are going to have trouble with it. Well, no, it's it's not just that, though, Super Tornado. Like, the workflow is very different to what most people are used to. Like... This stuff over here, this controls your weapon modes. Like, this controls the uh, the gain on the helmet, and the, oh sorry, the brightness of the helmet and the gain on the first. This is your master arm. This is the scan zone. This is the fucking scan zone switch to scan to the sides. And I think that's for a cooperative mode. That's, uh... That may be the launch authorization override, I'm not sure. That's just setting wingspan for the um, gun funnel, as well as for air to ground stuff, I think. And then that's your radar slash uh, master modes, basically. Well, not radar, but that's your master modes right there. So, KBR, I'm not sure what that is. MVG is navigation. RL is radar BDR. TP is the Erst, BB is close combat, Lushni boy. Schlem is the helmet site. OPT is, uh, I'm not actually sure. I think it's one of the outer ground modes. And then Phi Zero is the four site for the heat seekers. 
No, cooperative modes for the um, to get the radar and the Erst working at the same time in conjunction. The only way to do it in the FC3 means or the radar, depending what you lock them with. I team, I team D. But in the real aircraft, it's a separate switch somewhere. I that team, might be it, or it might be D. somewhere else. I can't Lightning. remember exactly where it is. It shouldn't be peeking out. I didn't even set the game that high. I'll try and talk quieter. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's it's so that the Earth and the radar work in conjunction with each other, but it is a separate switch somewhere in the cockpit. That might be it, or it might be somewhere else. I don't know. The problem with trying to read like abbreviations and technical terms in Russian is that it might be what I think it is, or it might be something completely different. Because Why does it keep telling me something's coming unplugged? Let me check something real quick. Mic cords on it. No, it's a fairly new mic. It shouldn't be having issues. It could be that something's loose, or it could be that it's trying to pick up the wrong microphone. But I don't know. I really don't know. Do you think you'll ever see the 23? Yeah. It's coming the 29 module. Yeah, it'll actually have modeled systems. Like, the systems in this are not modeled the way they should be. A lot of them are quite far off. Especially for a Soviet era MiG-29. Like, the RWR's program completely wrong for a Soviet era MiG-29. Also, we shouldn't, on the 29A, which is the 912, shouldn't have R-27 E series missiles, shouldn't have R-27Ts. Um, there's a lot of things the MiG-29A should not be able to carry, and it can carry the MiG-DCS. Pretty sure they're friendly anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Get some altitude. Happy beep ski day. Also, rip my sub street. Hey man, thanks for the resub. Don't worry about the street. It's all good. Appreciate the support either way. And uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to actually have Beepski Mark II finally running because the process of getting to this stage was anything but happy. I just had a lot of trouble, things that needed to be reinstalled several times. I had to retransfer my entire Steam directory because Steam didn't reinstall properly. A lot of dumb things like that. Range up. I can actually... I can visibly see him. That is so dumb. They really need to adjust the imposter dots. They're not... Real 
New specs. Uh, I up. Which mark specs? He'll tell you. And uh, so far, things are running very smoothly. Well, see, the thing I then hear is people with really high um, resolution monitors then can't see people right in front of their face. So it's either you see everything with the eye of God or you see nothing at all. It's just, the system needs an overhaul, really. That's the problem. I should probably not be flying at mill power. Why am I so low? Oh! They didn't actually put, yeah, okay, so it was the ground crew. They didn't put the fuel tank on. That's bizarre. Or I accidentally jettisoned it somehow, but I don't think I bumped the button for it. Well, whatever, we've got just enough fuel for one engagement, I guess. just did something I didn't tell it to. Lines might not be perfect yet. Well, the reason the 23 has a reputation of getting shot down in droves is twofold. First of all, the MiG-23 also had a bomber version, a dedicated fighter bomber version that didn't do air-to-air, -air. and guess what? Bombers have very high loss rates. That counts for most MiG-23 losses. Then the rest of 3MS, which was essentially a MiG-21 BIS wearing a MiG-23 as, as a mask, like wearing its its skin on its face, pretty much. The, um, the ML series 23s in particular actually made a really good account of themselves in the Iran-Iraq war, but popular history is that the 23 got spanked in every engagement it flew, so, oh well, if it means that people in DCS will underestimate it, all the better. Really? I don't know if you guys can hear me now, but remember I had this issue before and I couldn't work out what it was, but it just fixed itself? Maybe it's the same thing. Okay, so yeah. Bombers and MiG-23 MS, that's where the losses come from. The 23 ML was a competent fighter, a bit late, but a competent fighter. And if people in DCS underestimate the 23 as a threat, knowing that we're getting the MLA, then good for me. No, I know they're not. Hopefully ED actually read the charts right so they don't gimp the missiles right off the bat. That is really annoying.
Обнаружена цель. 280. Удаление 50 на 500. Сближайтесь. He's gonna launch on me here in a minute. Oh, you fuck. Very long shot, probably won't reach him, but whatever. I like to lob a beat for sleep. I don't know what keeps coming unplugged. radar off. Oh, it's not. It's in cooperative. I'm dumb. Сто 
I have to fight this guy. Fuck it. It's GS only. I don't like throwing them into their frames. Sams they have there, I wonder what their minimum engagement altitude is. I'm kind of tempted to try and land on the airbase just for memes, but I'm pretty sure I'll get killed doing it, because no fun is allowed on the Growling Sidewinder server. Got me, Roland figures. Am I still cutting out every couple minutes? Something is unplugging and plugging in, it seems. But I don't know what. For some reason the 29 fuel tanks aren't getting put on my plane, they might have run them out, or... You know what? I bet you he's fucking removed them. I bet you anything Growling Sidewinder has removed them, because he has this bizarre fucking idea that the shortest range planes should get screwed on, uh, spawns. He always sets it so the, the planes with the shortest range, like the 29 and the 27... Oh, sorry. 29 and the 21, my bad. Possible. I bet you that's what he's fucking done. I don't know why he does it. I don't know what the logic is, but I mean, implying there is logic on the other side of the server. That's a pretty good joke. No, just Su-27. I don't fly the J-11. I don't even have the bound. I only fly the Su-27 and the Su-33. If I'm going to fly a flanker, I'm going to fly the original flanker. R23 gets properly done R24. Might be better than the current DCS R27R in range. Yeah, so the guys in the Razbam Discord now, I haven't actually read through the documents, so I, I'm just repeating what I saw in there. Um, so. You guys should always take everything I say with a lot of salt, because I can't be right all the time and I forget a lot of shit, right? But, um... Apparently someone found documents that state that 27 actually locks on after launch and is capable of re-engaging a target after after dropping lock and regaining it. Now, I don't know how accurate that is, but apparently that's a thing it can do. And if it can do that, that's pretty impressive. Also, apparently the, um, the Soviet missile performance charts are lined off at um, their maximum effective combat range, which means they have about 2 or 3G of maneuvers left in them. Whereas that was interpreted by ED, and Western charts are usually the absolute that's as far as the missile will go, and it's out of energy or the battery's dead. Whereas with the R-27, apparently it has just a little bit more range. But it can't really use it on a, you know, on a target that's maneuvering. It's only for stuff that's not. Oh, 
the MLD didn't get R77s, that was a projected upgrade. The MLD could carry R73s, I believe. I don't know if it was in squadron service with them, but I, I think it could carry them. But um, the R77 was a commercial upgrade package that Mikoyan tried to offer to operators that, and, and no one bought it, so... It only ever carried the R23 and R24 series medium range missiles in Soviet service and, and uh, modern Russian service, as far as I know. C27 ergonomics are maybe marginally better than the MiG-29, but not quite much. Uh, it has a whole bunch of issues with its it's not going to be like flying a Western plane. All the systems are laid out differently. You don't notice it as much in uh, FC3, but it is very, very different. And a lot of people are going to learn that if we ever get a full fidelity flanker, and they will learn it when we get the uh, full fidelity from 29 I like having the default shadows back. I, I always hated seeing the shadows like flip through the ground and flicker. Oh, in DCS, no, it doesn't, because the, the Su-27 we have in DCS is a Su-27S, a Soviet vintage Su-27, they never carried it. The R-77 was not really carried until the modernized Su-27s, I think the uh, M2 and M3, oh, did the server go down? Connection timed out? Was that me or was that the server? That was the server, I think. I will attempt to uh, fix the audio a bit and turn that down. I haven't fixed my um, levels yet after the move, and I'm also trying to keep my voice down a little because I have neighbors all around me now. Um, and my mic's a little further away. I'll actually move that. Come here, please. Whoa. Oh, there we go. That should be a little better. But yeah, the, um, the only Su-27s that can carry R-77s are very heavily modernized, not the version we have in DCS. The R-77 didn't enter service until well after the Cold War ended. Even the um, R-27 ER and ET are, honestly, they're very close to the end of the Cold War. Like, they would have seen service for a couple months before the end of it. Much like the AMRAM, all the weapons that people think are Cold War weapons actually aren't. We fly, oh, that's modern though. DCS is pretty much a um, ghost town this time of night. We do have some guys up on blue flag 80s, so let's jump on there. We'll take 29 up again. Allegedly, the lock-on after launch, sorry if I'm blowing your ears out leaning into the mic. Um, lock-on after launch R-27 thing is how the Soviets would do TWS engagements with semi-active radar homing missiles. The radar would use the track file to gauge missile timeout and some preset time for it would switch to target an STT, engage the SIRH, then switch back. Ooh. So support each other's missiles um, for the Su-27. I know the MiG-31 could. And it, curiously enough, the Su-27, if you look in the cockpit, the um, little frequency switch that sets with so they can both talk to each other and not interfere with your flight members, um, that has 27 and 33 written on it. So at some point, there must have been the idea of slapping a, a um, R-33 on the Su-27, that or using Su-27s forward deployed to terminally guide in missiles coming from MiG-31s. So. I have to look into that more because that's really interesting. Really, really interesting. One minute. It might just be the drivers, I don't know. Everything back there should be plugged in nice and tight, so... It's like it's a rising USB bug. Oh boy, what is that? 
and how do I fix it? Do I just chuck in another USB slot? Or is it like, is this a problem I'm going to have regardless? I might slot up while I'm waiting. Where is everybody flying? Okay, he's flying from Kutaisi. He's flying from Batumi. I should actually probably check their website to see where things are. Uh, but if they're flying from Kutaisi, the closest for me would probably be my cop and or Nalchik. Nalchik's probably closer. We'll go from Nalchik and hope that we own it. That's where I can select the coalition. Mic's connected to a USB 2, you can try putting it in a 3.0 connector. Okay. I can do that. Um, I shouldn't be pulling too much power out of the back connectors, which is what this is plugged into, because my stick and throttle are plugged into the front connectors, and then the only flight sim peripheral that's in the back is the pedals. But we will see. Man, I do not know what is going on outside, slash upstairs, but it's fucking loud. <laughs> I live right by the end of the, um, one of the fly out paths for the airport here, so I get to hear jets go over all the time. It's pretty cool. Inspired me and a buddy start hopping on the Cold War server in MiG-19s, having tons of fun and learning a ton. Glad to hear it. More people on the Cold War server, the better. Okay, give me a minute to... Adjust myself here. Domestic? No, not today. <laughs> I haven't actually heard any domestic since that first time I moved in, so maybe it was a one off thing. Hopefully, it was a one off thing. set the load out manually by the way guys uh, we need to get a petition going for ED to add the R60 to this not the R60M it has that but the R60 because um, it would be nice to actually be able to use them on the Cold War server because the way Alpen sets a lot of the missions up and Alpen is very very hard-headed about this the MiG-29 ends up with only two R-27s because he doesn't want the MiG-21s getting their hands on R-60s. Oh, sorry, R-60Ms. So. That's something we need to push through to ED. Please give this base model R-60s. Boys, Alpin for keeping that server afloat. Yeah, I don't know how he does it. The amount of work he has to sink into it, especially every time ED breaks the uh, warehousing, it's pretty ridiculous. If 
not other fixes for some people is change PCIe speed back to 3.0 from 4.0. Always recommend using external USB hub with own power connection for everyone using the amount of peripherals we do is for DCS. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I used to use a external hub, but I didn't have a, like its own power connection for it. They're surprisingly difficult to find where I am, but I probably will get one at some point. <clears throat> losing my voice. Since the past month or so, both AMD and motherboard makers made BIOS updates to try and deal with this stuff, but for some people it's still happening. Mm -hmm. Oh well, I'm sure it'll get fixed eventually. Hey, now we got some reds on. Happy days. 125 for live GCI. Oh, that's right, I need to get... I haven't reinstalled SRS. Bear with me. I tab out for a minute while I set this up. still have the installer on my PC? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I'll just have to fly without it for now. I'll install it later. Yeah, because it's got to hook into the scripts and everything. We'll fly blind. <laughs> Oh, shit, no. Gotta wait for them to finish rearming me. Thing on their team BVR capable ZF15, so I might switch to the 21 after this. See how it goes. If it keeps being a problem, I'll just get a hub for it. But I did have this problem before on my old PC and it went away. It, it happened for like one or two streams, just at random, and then it went away. So I tend to just put it down to the te uh, tech curse that I obviously have. 
because it seems to have no rhyme or reason to it. Oh god, this game looks so beautiful with these settings. So I've got to remember to install SRS after the stream. Yeah, I just plugged it into one of the USB 3 ports. Because it was on the same row as my uh, camera, my keyboard, and my mouse before. I think there's something else in there too. Affected the heart ass, that would be very, very annoying. a beer. That is a hell of a beer. the old setup uh, it was a was it a 4670k a 1050 ti for a video card 32 gigabytes of ddr3 because that was all my motherboard supported and i was still on windows 7 <laughs> which i miss i actually really loved windows 7 it's the best operating system i've ever used and starting to settle into 10 a little, but there's still a lot that I really don't like about it, but 7 was just perfect. Yeah, huge improvement. This is the first time in my entire life I've actually bought like a brand new, up-to-date, top-of-the-line PC. I've always had to make do with kind of obsolescent ones that were, you know, middle sort of spec even back when they were new. And then I've usually had the same PC for anything between 5 and 10 years, so... My previous PC was, uh... I originally built it in 2009, but then I had to rebuild it due to a motherboard blow up in 2013. so nice actually being able to see things. Look at this. When I um, disconnect from here I might bump the anti listing back down to two times. I don't really need it set at four. Not unless I'm taking screenshots. Should get a few frames back out of that but it's really smooth. Like I'm getting a little bit of stutter out of the track IR but nowhere near what I used to have. The game itself is like butter. Oh, hello. Hey, Yogatello. I don't accidentally overfly a SAM side here. That happens to me a lot, especially IR SAMs. Uh, 
Uh, I'm thinking about it. I might keep this monitor as my main one, but I might also get a slightly bigger one. I don't want like a massive monitor because I don't really have the space for it and I also uh, don't want to end up blind when it comes to spotting in DCS. But maybe like a 27 inch or something. This is actually a new monitor. I only bought this about six months ago, maybe even less, because my old one blew up. see him already. Like I said, it's kind of silly. We're going to slap him to the burners, pick up some speed and some altitude, because we want to go into this as fast as we can. Especially since that's a 16 most likely. Is it emptied actually? Oh, that might be the 15 actually. That's probably what that is. I guess. Don't underestimate sparrows. Let's take a twenty one. Well, I didn't defend that very well, to be honest. I could have done a lot better there. Also, it would have helped if I was on SRS, but, you know, big brain me forgot to actually install it. Oh. No, not the low vis on the regular. There we go. I like how even with this PC, the um, rearm menu in DCS makes it freeze up for a bit. Take two of God's missile. Take uh, are R60Ms banned? No, they're not. Of course they're not. There's R73s. I'm thinking of the other Cold War. Okay. Командир, оружие подвижно. 
paired up with that R60. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love being mig explained to by someone that doesn't even fucking fly the thing and hasn't for a long time. Uh, I think we're sector 222 in Nalchik. Actually, I don't need that. They're probably going to be flying pretty high, that F-15 especially. Let's set that to like 11. I don't know what the wingspan of an F-15 is, but I'm sure that's close enough. Got the kill on him? Really? Huh. Interesting. We must have been, like, right at the same time we hit each other. Thank you. R3R is better than R60M. Fight me. No one here is going to fight you. We all know on this stream that the R3R is God's missile. I think it's fucking amazing. R3R is responsible for the vast majority of my F14 kills. Not just in the MiG-21, I think I've killed more F14s with the R3R and the 21 than I have with basically anything else. They get overconfident. They think you can't hit them from the front because on Cold War it's rear aspect only, except for the R3R. And then, uh, boop, right in the face. almost feel the surprise radiate out of them. So, okay, I have been told, and I have actually wondered this for a while because I'd seen evidence of it before, I've been told that the MiG-21's radar doesn't give a lock warning or a launch warning until way too late to react, which sounds like a bug. But at the same time, a lot of them just, they see the missile, launch. like I can tell they see the missile launch because they drop flares and they just continue flying into it. So even if the radar was giving them a warning when it should be, I don't think it would help most of them because they're a bit dead upstairs, if you get me. I don't know how many of you saw it, but in one of the um, Persian Gulf 85 events after the end of it, when everyone was just kind of screwing around, Yink managed to get, like, a fucking 15-mile kill with an R3R. It was ridiculous. How well does Chaff work on the R3R? I don't know, because no one in the Cold War server ever takes it, right? But Chaff in DCS doesn't work properly anyway, so... Nice clean takeoff in the MiG-21. Who the fuck is this guy? Did they update the sounds? No, that is Nin's sound mod that I'm using. You can find it on the forums under the MiG-21 section. I think it's actually pinned, like the topic's pinned to the, the 21 subforum. It is absolutely fantastic, and he has a new version of it coming out pretty soon, I think. Man, I don't remember the cockpit shaking this much. Damn, son. Overlord. 
Discord 1131. Request bogey dope. Can't do external views in this server or I'd show you the external sounds because they're really nice. Really, really nice. Ah, oh, now I'm back home. This is where I should be. Just for the sub, man. Appreciate it. shaking and I'm very I mean I came out of burner too early that's probably why I'm slow but I feel like I'm draggier than usual hmm. nice song for work what's the playlist it's the uh, synthwave playlist that I use so all my playlists I put on stream as well as a couple extras are pinned in the uh, music channel on my discord DJ cool as jukebox named after my old loud like really noisy ass air conditioner I used to have which was the predominant sound you could hear in any stream I did during the summer for the past couple of years. But, uh, tap out. And actually, if you put exclamation mark song, it'll tell you, but I think this is part of a compilation video. Copy check in settings, probably. No, my settings haven't changed. Like, the bindings did, but the actual in game settings didn't. It's probably just my frame rate was too low to notice it before. That's probably what it is. I've got a new one. I got a new air conditioner like a year or so ago, and it works really well. It's actually about the same volume, but it actually cools the room down, whereas the other one just made a hell of a lot of noise and didn't do much else. Overlord, one, 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 three, one. Request bogey dope. Kick the burner on for a bit so I can climb a little more. Yeah, it was a bit that way. It used to leak water all over the floor as well, which was uh, annoying. Let's check everything's up. Here's up. Flaps should be up. Not that they would drag me back at this speed. Rates are in. Yeah. Probably just because I haven't flown the 21 for quite a while, and I've got a higher frame right now, so I can see the shaking. I'm also flying much higher than I usually am, which probably doesn't help. Overlord, one, 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 three, one. Request bogey dope. No, it's just quiet. Oh, we're a little outnumbered. WR doesn't say anything. So yeah, after the stream I'll uh, reinstall SRS, so next time I fly on here I'll be able to have the live GCI, which was very nice the last time I played here. Yes, players are allergic to night ops and weather. Mm-hmm. Boy, are they ever. Speaking of night ops, I might do a run through of my intercept mission. Once I hop off here. I'll we'll probably have to end the stream reasonably soon as well, just so I don't make too much noise too late at night, and also because uh, I'm losing my voice and I'm hungry. The biggest problem with flying at night in a PvP environment is the fucking gamma shitters. If there was a way to block people from adjusting their gamma, like server side or something, it would be perfect. 
but instead you end up with a couple of people that just fly like it's daylight because it basically is to them while the rest of us are blundering about totally you know can't even tell where the ground is Thing. I don't think they really used it much. The um, I think the Mi-24 guys did in Afghanistan, but generally night vision while flying in the dark wasn't that much of a thing until the very late 80s or the 90s, even in the West. Like, a lot of the stuff that people kind of assume is... Well, you know, stuff that people take for granted is a lot more recent than they think, whereas things that people think is recent is not recent. Here. Zero SA, that is me. Keep an eye on my fuel as well. 98 kilometers from home. <laughs> I mean, technically, I think the US had them before the Soviets did, they just decided they were crap because the uh, early sidewinders couldn't keep up with them, whereas the Soviets had a mature, you know, very maneuverable air-to-air -air missile by the time they decided to start moving to helmet sides. Not just the Agile, the VTAS on the Phantom, I think that was actually used operationally, but again, the older sidewinders were crap with it, so that it was basically useless. Very heavy. Very, very chunky boy. Chaz. Don't worry, I've done that a couple times. I think the best one was when I uh, fell. I was out of the farm, so I had to have my data on. I fell asleep in the middle of a stream, had it on all night. Overlord, one, 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 three, one. Request bogey dope. Huey, huh? I think there's something else around here too, though. That's probably an EWR pinging me. See Guri Dam there. There's probably something lurking around here. Don't know if it's an aircraft or if it's just ground units shooting it out though. I also don't know whose fault that is. I'm going to assume it's one of ours. Go ahead and flip this into side low production. I've really got to fix my seating setup with this. It's really uncomfortable. Dope. 
the FARP isn't shooting at me yet, so it probably is one of ours. Which probably means someone's hanging around here working it over. Maybe the A-10. server actually has quite a bit of shore ads, so I probably shouldn't get too low near to uh, enemy held areas. I'd say that's probably an EWR off my nose somewhere. Most likely in those hills. Overlord, one, 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 three, one. Request bogey dope. Okay, well he can't see me anymore, I guess. Kutaisi's picked me up, so I might have some AI phantoms to deal with here in a minute. Which will be a good moment of truth. We'll see if the phantoms uh, lose lock on me if I stay low against the ground like they should. Mind you, they're at 4 E's. I think they had an improved radar. Fuel. I know it is, isn't it, girl? Getting A6 intruder carry up sesh when the A6 intruder comes out. Since we know it's being worked on now, albeit as an AI to begin with. This is really silly what I'm doing here. Ooh, hello. Not that one. That one. No, we'll see ya. Oh, whoops, just lent on my trigger. <sighs> Whoopsie daisies. Overlord, one, 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 three, one. Request bogey dope. Uh, the auto mod's very oversensitive. It blocks stuff for dumb reasons sometimes. Okay, I can't get any rise out of that. I probably need to use the F10 AWR. If that even sees anything back here, it probably won't because I'm over the mountains in enemy territory. I did see something jamming though, right before I got shot at. Distance. See him. It's pretty much right over Kataisi. It might even be an AWAX. That was a power line. When 
too low to pick him up because the radar doesn't scan that high. Let's try and make sure I'm not too close to the airfield. decent amount of time on the radar. Give it another minute or two and then flip it back off. So I'm probably going to need to RTB for fuel anyway. I don't think there's anything really here I can engage. I'm pretty sure that was an AWACS or something, or maybe a fighter, I don't know. But it was too high, it was over their SAMs. So I would have had to have climbed into the uh, lethal zone to go get him. find that far up again. Maybe the A-10 will come back for it. It's around here somewhere, wasn't it? Of him, he's way above me, I think. It's probably the F 15. Not oh, yeah. No, that was a Sam, I think. Oof. No, it was the F 15. play on this server enough to know what's going on so I get killed a lot. Let's see. I might hop out and we'll do that night mission and then I think I'm going to call it for the stream. Um, I'll, I might see if I can sneak in some Cold War, probably not tomorrow uh, or the day after because I've got an appointment. Maybe Saturday, my time. Uh, I will also tweak these a little more. So I'll turn that down to two times. Um... I think we're pretty good on settings though. I'm pretty happy with that. 
I do need to make one change to this though. Because, unfortunately, my stand-in RF4 here has a telepathic ability to tell when you've launched on him and frequently evades my missiles. The mission editor still freezes. Well done, ED. Very high quality. Okay. Um, I'm gonna try and remember how to do this. There's like some setting. Advance, I think. ROE is return, fire. No, we want to change that. Uh, so we'll go waypoint one. And then it doesn't change, that's probably why. So. How do I change that? ROE. Weapon hold. Okay. Because he's an RF4, right? And we'll add another, uh, which is... Reaction to threat. Set it to passive. And then we'll also go. Uh, a lot of these aren't relevant because I'm not flying on the same team as him. Turn that off. Never use because he's an RF4E. Or RF4C. That's what he's meant to be, but we don't have one, so I've had to use a F4E. Okay. Oh yeah, the, the AI are very incredible. I wish I was half as good as the AI are. So from here, I've got to make sure I actually fly direct. So, uh, I could probably cut the corner, like once I'm over uh, Bezlan. Set my beacon for Bezlan, cross over that, then head southwest then head northwest i just fly this off the cuff a lot of the time so i tend to miss the intercept point or get like in a bad angle where all he has to do is a basic evasive maneuver and he chucks my missiles which is not what this mission's about but ideally i want to try and get a head-on intercept with him with a very high closing speed because that's what i want to practice Oop. don't move in too far i won't be able to move my pedals so the whole point of this mission is it's meant to be like a pure air defense scenario. So, unknown intruder at very high speed. Find him, kill him. Okay. Uh, what's this on? 10 and then 8 for Nalchik. down a little. Turn, oh no, don't want that, want that. Turn that up a little, put that on a little. We'll just leave that. Okay. Those are both on. That's set. Two, two, two. That's all set. That's all set. Okay. Oh, actually, need to dim the reticles slightly.
across that line. In fact, you guys are going to not be able to see me very well, but I'll turn it off. I can't really see what I'm doing. There we go, that's much better. That's gonna fuck with the green screen, sorry guys. I just need to be able to see the left side of my monitor because the lamp right there is glaring on it really badly. script. I know they exist. Uh, there's a single mission on the user files side with one. It's very good actually. Really, really good. I need to figure out how to do that and then whack one in this mission. DCS runs beautifully, dude. Absolutely beautifully. And that's without my PC running at its full capacity right now. So I forgot to do the uh, RAM clock speed. So as well as uh, doing that and installing SRS, which I forgot to do, I will also be um, getting FSX set up, because I haven't flown it for ages, making sure it still works with everything, and then FS2020, so I can fly both of them on stream as well. Because I want to do um, the same sprint I used to do in FSX when I did stream it before the lightning sprint between Bathurst and Canberra again since I have made that move in real life now. slightly so we're still in burner but we're in min burner instead of full just because I don't want to overspeed the aircraft which is very easy to do at this altitude even without the heat switch at this kind of altitude in this thinner air it will easily exceed 1300 in level flight and we're looking for Mount Elbrus which is our visual reference but I don't think we're actually that close to it. I need to fly along the line mountains a bit. Probably should have turned in earlier.
I've had this thing up to about mark 2.15 before, and my altitude record in DCS was also set in the MiG-21 at 83,500 feet. And that was with a full combat load, that was two R3Rs and four R60s. That was a draggy loadout. Okay, I should be coming in from roughly the right aspect here. I'm a little high though, I don't want to get above him, I want to stay slightly below him. Notice the aircraft's very wobbly because the ARU's in its high speed mode. Nope, we're riding 1300, I need to come out of burner just a little bit and bring the nose up. Mark 1.8. There we go. 25 for 80. I'm going to have seconds to react. missile, the R3R, hold it right in the center of that, radar scope, ah oh, he still evades, motherfucker, I'll just have to set him to passive, accidentally zoom climb to whatever height I'm at. <sighs> I'm going to have to set him to not react, because otherwise he just gets out the way of them easily. 15? Yeah. No, 22. <laughs> I shouldn't be throttling back at this altitude, that's a bad idea. We'll just let him go. I'll go land at Namchu. Power back on. So we need some airspeed. See, that's a problem. Even with that little time to react, it's like he's ready. He's expecting to be shot at, so he just fucking yanks on the stick. So I'll set him to completely passive. And it should be easy to kill him then. I have flown this mission a bunch of times, and if he doesn't react, he's dead. It's just that suddenly, I think there was a change to the AI or something. Because suddenly, he never reacted before, but now he's reacting every time. I also probably waited a bit too long for that second R3R. I should have fired it right away. Probably should have even self fired them. Try putting him on recruit, that might do it. I didn't actually pay attention to what difficulty he was on, but that would explain a few things if he's on uh, pace or something. Come back off the power, because we don't need it, we'll just glide down. No, that 
that's not the switch I'm looking for. That's the switch I'm looking for. Try the auto landing? I don't know how to use it. I've never used the auto landing in this, I just land by hand all the time. Picked up a little bit of altitude there, I was a bit careless by switching stuff off. There we go. And then the PRMG, I can't remember what channel that's meant to be set on. I can never remember. I need to actually study up on the radio navigation on this because I usually just fly visual and use the RSBN as a kind of point home beacon. Same channel? Gotcha. correct side. I can never remember. Is it the south side? North to south. Yeah, okay. Because I usually come in the other way. Let's do one of these ones to bleed some speed. Right hand open. See, I almost always come in the other end, so I'm used to just going around that way. stage flat. Take the wheels. Landing light. Two stage flat. I do actually need to study up on how to use this stuff though, because I, um, I mean I do fly at night sometimes, but with the lights on it's easy to find the runway, but I don't really fly that much in really bad weather. I fly in bad weather, but not really bad weather. Okay, three greens, flaps, 350, we're coming in a little steep, we can fix that. It's interesting they have an old chick set up for uh, oh, hang on, north to south. I'm dumb, I'm landing the wrong direction, aren't I? <laughs> we'll go around. Got enough fuel for it. I know how to compass. So yeah, I usually do come in from the right way. I was just thinking, like, it's funny how there's no lights on this end. It's like, oh, hang on. Yeah, plenty 
of fuel. I just blew out my fucking landing lights. I forgot to raise them. Because I don't use them usually. <laughs> Even when I'm flying at night, I usually just go in by the uh, approach lights. Okay. One stage flap. Pull the nose to lead some speed. Yeah. Two stage flap. Off the power a little. I'll just coast it down. Might be a little bit of wind. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of wind. really uncoordinated today. shoot this time. Yeah, I blew the lights out. Oopsie daisies. grass. Something killed the phantom. I don't know what. Maybe two got him. I didn't embarrass myself too much there. It's been a while since I landed this thing at night. I think I did one the other day just to practice it, but... We need more night missions. More night Cold War missions. <laughs> I mean, you already know what I'm going to be in most of the time anyway. I fucking love this thing. I like a lot of modules in DCS, but this will forever be my favourite, I think. Even though the MiG-23 is my favourite jet, I think this will be my favourite module. We'll see. Maybe Razbam can one-up them. We'll see. I hope they can, because I like the MiG-23 so much, but I don't know. It may not click with me. Like, that's the thing. It may be one of those things where I just can't get the flying style right. I'm like that with a couple planes. But the MiG-21, something about it. It's just right for me. So, 
That's all. Oh, I set myself to the uh, low-vis version on this mission. I forgot about that. It's still got a little ways to go, but I've got to say the changes they made over the past year or so to DCS's lighting engine, it, it's really starting to look good at night. It used to look horrible at night. Now it's still not quite there, but it's getting there. It's really getting there. You're doing. He is coming into land. You're gonna laugh if you see the F-15 for MSFS. Just seen someone streaming absolutely pulling money grab. Yeah, I noticed a lot of the first few military jets to come out were basically ports and they weren't like super super carefully done ports either so i'm gonna wait for like the proper modules to come out personally it's an interesting approach he's got going on there mr bavarian thanks for the follow welcome to the stream just about to wrap up for the evening he's still got his belly tank i don't know why the ai don't jettison them when they're empty landing, shall we? He's still got all his missiles, so he didn't shoot the Phantom down. I don't know what did, but it did go down, apparently. because the AI always land perfectly, even if their approaches are worse than mine. I think my favorite thing about MiG-21 at night is the luminous paint. So even when the jets all shut down, you got this beautiful glow in the dark stuff going on. I'm uh, Partway through my cockpit modification, like the textures for it, but I've got to reinstall Photoshop on my PC since you know, new PC, new Photoshop. Um, but we're getting there. I got a lot of it done. So, for those who aren't as pedantic as me and haven't noticed the difference, I've been changing a lot of the fonts to actually match the correct ones because they didn't quite use the right ones for a lot of the labeling. Some of it they did, some of it they didn't. Um, I fixed a few typos, there was a really obnoxious one there, a couple of others around the cockpit. Um, I haven't done the loom paint stuff yet except for a couple of labels towards the front, but we'll get around to it. And by the time I've finished it and actually release it to the public, uh, the full MiG-21 cockpit update will probably be out, which will just basically rework the whole thing anyway. Oh well. Right. Cheers for the resub, Izzy. Uh, try not to breathe in the cancer dust in the bathroom. I'm telling you, go to today tonight with... Oh, wait, no. To, is today tonight still a thing? A current affair. Go to a current affair with that shit. They'll be all over it. 
then you can afford to move to a much better place. Heard some factory labels were misspelled on real stuff. Yeah, some of them were. Um, so the way I did this was I went through and I looked for a bunch of different references. Um, most of the references I could find were MiG-21MFs, um, but a lot of the labeling's close enough to guess what's not there. Um, so if I see a typo on a reference, I'll mimic it. If I don't see a typo on a reference, I'll correct it if it's on the module. Um, there's also different fonts, so over the production run of the MiG-21 and the ASP in particular, because this was used in a lot of aircraft. Uh, thanks for the follow, by the way, Zergberger. I noticed that a couple of different fonts were used, so this is the late font. This is basically a standard engineering font that you'd see anywhere in the world, but the earlier um, Soviet standard version has like more squared off A's, like they lean to the right and the right leg of the A is straight. Um, kind of more like what you see in the MiG-19 to a degree. I was kind of on the fence whether to make this version or that version. I kind of like the original version more aesthetically speaking, but it's just easier to do this and this uh, better suits the late production 21. And then there's stuff like I added the actual tails to the arrows here because I noticed on most ASPs they had those tails on them, whereas in the module it didn't. Little things like that. Uh, interestingly, I actually changed the font on here only to then see some photos of a uh, Romanian, I think it was, MiG-21 BIS, or sorry, MiG-21 MF um, with the original ASP unit, and the actual original font the module had was closer, so it seems like the Soviets played mix and match a lot. I also changed this little guy right there. A little more detail. I actually, I went into War Thunder because I noticed that their um, Yak-38 had a really fairly detailed ASP model, or texture rather. So I went in, I looked up the GOST number, which is like the Soviet state standard number, looked up the GOST number on the gauge in War Thunder, and then I was like, oh yeah, Googled it, and uh, that's what I based this off of. Uh, this is the kind of shit I do instead of being like a normal functional human being. Anyway, uh, with that said, I'm going to find somewhere I can send you guys so I can get myself some very, very delayed dinner and a drink so I don't lose my voice and finish setting up SRS and a few other things. So hopefully by a weekend, uh, I should have more or less a fully functional PC. I still got to move a few things over, reinstall a few things, but I just wanted to get it up and running so I could actually stream and we appear to have achieved that. MiG-21's like the AK-47 of fighter jets, it's been exported and made in quite a few countries with some changes. Yeah, and that's one of the nice things about it. So if you really want to, you could like mix and match from a bunch of different aircraft, and it would be technically correct. Like some of the reference photos I've seen are bits and pieces from all kinds of like an early ASP and then a late um, instrument panel and stuff moved around, so. But I'm trying to, like, just because I noticed that a lot of the fonts weren't quite right, the MiG-19 has the same thing I'm gonna tweak that eventually as well. I was like, hmm, how can I fix this? So I'm pretty happy with how it's coming along so far. Who else is on? Let me see. Yeah, I turned the lamp off because at night I can't see. Like, it, it was glaring on the screen. Ah, that's right, I'm not logged on on my Steam browser anymore. Bear with me, we're going to tab out and do this. This is going to be extremely scuffed. Sorry about the green screen artifacting, by the way, because the light was off. This is the real test of my new PC. Can it tolerate me opening like 300 Firefox tabs while DCS is still running and I'm streaming? Surprisingly, the answer appears to be yes. Checks on. I'll send you guys over his way. He is playing uh, War Thunder. Now, I know what you guys are thinking, all you DCS players, but 
is interesting to watch, see the differences, see some of the beautiful prototype aircraft we'll never see in DCS. So I'll send you over his way. Oh, dude, I'm so bad with tabs. I'll like try and watch a video, like a, a half hour documentary on something, and then I'll open another 10 tabs by the time I'm done watching that one. ADHD and like a strong interest in military history do not mix well at all. Alrighty, thank you all for sticking with me despite the numerous technical issues and the hour or so I spent rebinding all my aircraft. <laughs> At least we won't have to do it next stream. Hope you guys, hope you guys all have a uh, wonderful day, evening, morning, whatever time it is where you are. Stay safe and I will catch you most likely over the weekend for some probably Cold War, maybe we'll squeeze some armor in. And uh, I do still have to play Ace Combat 7 at some point. God damn it, Polar, why do you do this to me? Catch you guys later. Enjoy Core Jack.